Good morning, everyone. Um, I think we're going to begin um, our time with prayer, but before we pray, I just want to say welcome to everyone. Uh, welcome to our time with uh, Reverend Dr. Kevin, Kevin Muriel, who has continually blessed us, blessed us even on yesterday by preaching at, I uh, would say, St. Luke for their 87th anniversary, and he did an awesome job. I've heard lots of comments from people that listened in. Um, so we're going to also let... Um, Reverend Dr. Owen Ross greet you this morning because he's a man of just a few words, so I know he wants to say hello. And then if once he greets you, if Deborah, if you'll open us up with prayer. Uh, good morning, everyone, and it is an honor to be here with you and appreciate the work that has gone into making this, this possible, Reverend Masters, and appreciate Dr. Muriel and taking time to be with us. And I continue just to be inspired how our churches are responding to this, this new reality that we are living in and, and assisting our community. So thanks for taking time to be here uh, this morning. And I, I know we'll all be blessed, so. Thank you. Well, as we move into a time of prayer, I'm pleased to be, be with all of you. I'm Deborah Hobbs Mason, the Metro District Superintendent. Um, Kevin, I've seen you from afar, but we don't know one another. So thank you for being <laughs> with the group today. and journeying with our pastors on us for the last couple of years mm -hmm. different groups Enjoy. Yeah. Um, in this prayer i'm gonna take some moments of silence don't worry that i've muted myself or fallen off or anything those are moments for you to to lift up specific names in silent prayer as i um lift some things up i think it'll make sense uh, in the midst of the prayer times if you would please your join, join your hearts with mine as we go to God in prayer. Loving God, your desire is for our wholeness and well-being. We hold in tenderness and prayer the collective suffering of our world at this time. We grieve precious lives lost and vulnerable lives threatened. We ache for ourselves and our neighbors, standing before an uncertain future. We pray, O oh God, may love, not fear, go viral. Inspire our leaders to discern and choose wisely, guided by concern for the common good and for all your children. Reveal to us new and creative ways to come together in spirit and in solidarity. Remind us, Lord, of those who suffer every day, for whom this crisis is even more devastating. May we who are merely inconvenienced remember those whose lives are at stake. May those who have no risk factors remember those most vulnerable. May we who have the luxury of working from home remember those who must choose between preserving their health or making their rent. May we also remember those for whom more time at home is not comforting, peaceful, or safe. Mm -hmm. Lord, also help us to remember those who have no home to take shelter in. May those who have the flexibility to care for our children when schools close, remember those who have no options. May we who are losing our margin money in the tumult of the economic market, 
Remember those who have no margin at all. As fear and anxiety grip our country, let us choose love. During this time when we cannot physically wrap our arms around each other, let us find ways to be the loving embrace of God to our neighbor and our world. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Deborah. Good morning again, everyone. Um, this is our second year of having this cohort with Reverend Dr. Kevin Nerio. Many of you know him. Uh, Cammie invited him to come to the clergy retreat. And so he's been there, not just for the Black pastors, but he's been here for all of us. And I, I uh, am so honored to call him friend. And Kevin, I want you to know I am now spelling your name correctly. I publicly say that I have misspelled your name. And so um, it is now I'm doing a better job with that. So I thank you. For those that's been a part of the cohort, you will know that we have a very solid uh, and full agenda every time, but we're fluid with that. We like to be led by the Holy Spirit. So we're going to be led by the Holy Spirit today. I want to just say as a we have introduction to those of you that may not have been at clergy retreat or a part of the cohort, who he is. Um, he is the pastor of Cascade United Methodist Church in Atlanta, Georgia, one of the uh, largest United Methodist churches in our nation, and one of the churches that's really thriving. And I believe he is thriving for two reasons. One, because he's a child of God and he follows the leading of the Holy Spirit and his gifts in leadership. Um, he's a solid leader. His congregation responds to his leading, and I am excited about that. He's married, has a beautiful daughter, and is about to have a son just any day right now. And if you talk to him, he'll tell you that he, he's looking forward to having that, that son any, any day. So Cascade is in really good hands, and the pastors of the North Texas Conference uh, have been in good hands with him. I see Derek on the on the call. I see Dr. Bowie on the call. Uh, I don't see Sharon, but Sharon is, is going to be on the call. Those were pastors in our cohort last year, and they can tell you that we had a really good time. So y'all can just kind of do thumbs up or nod your head. It's, it's really been fun. And our pastors that's on the call now, that's with him now, or Latasha Roberts, I see Miranda. Uh, I don't see the others. My screen only holds so many, but we have had a really good time this year. So uh, normally I start off with how is it with your soul? Uh, but because we're going to be fluid with this time, and I know Cammie uh, has another appointment, so we're going to ask her to bring some questions. Um, about leadership. Uh, leadership is our first thing on the agenda. And as she is preparing to uh, speak, uh, Dr. Muriel, is there anything you want to say? Do you bring us greetings from Cascade? We certainly do. Good morning to everyone. And it is so good to see uh, my extended family uh, from the North Texas Conference. I feel like I've spent more time there than I have in North Georgia. Uh, <laughs> but I, I certainly appreciate the wonderful ministry uh, that you all are uh, exhibiting around the world and uh, certainly honor your leadership. Uh, Owen and Diana have done a dynamic job of putting uh, these cohorts together and I see uh, several of those who have uh, participated in the last couple of years and I just we've had a phenomenal time so thank you all for being the trendsetters uh, in this regard and uh, for uh, certainly investing uh, in your clergy. So good to be here. Thank you. Cammie? Sure. So welcome again, uh, Dr. Muriel. We're glad you're here. And thanks uh, for all the investments, like, like uh, as Diana said, uh, that you've given us. Uh, if we feel like you are part of a uh, home here. So just, you know, call it home. We like that. <laughs> um, so, you know, I was thinking about you. And one of the things that uh, strikes me is that you have such a fresh, real, honest, uh, and creative way of being a leader. 
And I just want to say how much that's inspiring. It's been inspiring to me. It was inspiring when you were at the retreat. And um, so thank you for just stepping up. Um, I've been reading a book and just getting started on it called Who Do We Choose to Be? Mm -hmm. Facing Reality, Claiming Leadership, and Restoring Sanity. <laughs> and I just had to laugh at that title. Um, but, you know, I think it's so true of, you know, who, who are we choosing to be right now? And I wanted just to ask you some questions about really your own way of being and how you're leading uh, in these past, if this past six weeks, particularly, if uh, you don't mind me just uh, probing you a bit. Uh, <laughs> so I, <laughs> I was thinking that we could learn from, you know, someone who, uh, as yourself, who, like I said, is fresh, honest, and creative. So um, I've got some categories that I'm thinking about. Um, worship, pastoral care, Christian education. Um, I think that later on this afternoon, you'll have an opportunity to speak to mission and outreach. So I'm going to pass that one. Um, and the last one is ordering the life of the church, you know, how to keep the church going, right? So, um, so I want to, want to know if you could answer um, the question, what decisions have you made during this time that are uh, specific decisions in these certain categories. So what decisive things have you <laughs> done um, in the area of worship that have been a change or some significant move um, that has been reaching the need of people right now? Thanks, that's a great question. Um, and I'll first start off by uh, saying that, you know, I come to this in the same position that all of you are in. Uh, I'm a pastor just like you. Uh, I care about God's people just like you. I have, we have had to make the adjustment just like everybody else. I've had sleepless nights and long days of worry about uh, how things are going to go. Uh, we are in week seven of not meeting together. And, um, you know, that's difficult not to, I, this is, I don't know about you, but this has been my first Easter that I have never been physically at church. Mm. Reality set in on that day, mm -hmm. not being uh, in the physical space. Um, and, but I realized that many of our buildings had to close for the church to open. Mm. And I don't believe that anything happens, um, you know, by mistake. I think, I think it's, it's, there's some, there's some divine plan somewhere in this that we're going to draw at some point somewhere at some time. And I, and I honestly think it's already being seen. Uh, I will say uh, churches have had to churches who did not have online ministries, uh, whether they're broadcasting now from the kitchen or from their backyard or uh, from the dinner table uh, are having to make that adjustment uh, for years. We have tried to get our people, to uh, become more innovative and think forward uh, because as leaders, we're always thinking ahead. And sometimes we think further ahead than our people. Uh, and we're trying to bring them on and say, hey, we need to do this. We, we need, because this is the way of the world. This is how everybody's shifting. Um, and now, so for me, it's been, it's answering the question, what does it mean to live into a reality to where you're forced to do church differently altogether? You were forced to rethink everything you've always done. Uh, and theologically, I go back to, and I have really been on this verse. I did a lesson on it last week. I talked about the ministry of mental health, and I'll talk about that more in a moment from the Christian education perspective, uh, but the ministry of mental health and this idea that Paul raises in, in Romans 12 too, uh, about the, the renewing of the mind, uh, that that we should have a renewed sense of thinking during the season. And so what we've had to do, honestly, uh, is, is Cammie, we've had to rethink everything, uh, mm -hmm. particularly worship. Worship has always been our, worship has always been our business card or our calling card, if you would. 
more than likely people are going to come to your church through the experience of worship that they have with you. Nobody's going to say, I want to join your church because they attend a finance meeting mm. or because they came to a trustee meetings or they came to an admin council meeting. It's just not going to happen. Mm. Uh, the difference now that we're experiencing is that when you go online any given Sunday, really or any given moment of the day, I guarantee if somebody logged on to Facebook right now, you would see some kind of church service in progress. Uh, mm -hmm. that's the difference now is that churches, and I don't like to use the word, use the word competition, but people have more options now than they've ever had to attend church mm -hmm. because they're doing it virtually. They're doing it from the cell phone, doing it from the computer or, or whatever smart device they have. And so the question that we had to ask ourselves is, okay, we know what we do in Atlanta. We know how we distinguish ourselves in the city of Atlanta. We know that we have a large following in Atlanta. But when we're on the, now at 10 o'clock a.m., when we're online with 2,000 other ministries, what is, gonna want, what is it that people are going to see from us that they want to stay on our page? Mm. And so that's kind of where we had to begin. Um, I'm glad that we put some of the technological systems in place well before this. So we've been doing online ministry for a while. So we already had an infrastructure. Uh, and so some of the hard decisions that we had to make, frankly, is how do we curate a worship experience every week for people that is different and unique and fresh? See, that's something we really didn't have to really worry about in the physical space. I mean, it, it was a routine. Again, the renewing of the mind. It was a routine, right? We knew when the call to worship was coming. We knew how it was going to come. We knew that we were going to do the doxology at a certain point. We knew what choirs were going to sing. But what happens when you can't get your choirs lined up on a certain Sunday to sing, and you know now they're out of rotation? Mm -hmm. How do you how do you create a virtual choir, right? Um, because again, people have about and and what we've experienced through our analytics, people connect to you for about a minute. Mm -hmm. before they scroll on to the next thing. If you haven't grabbed them in a minute, then uh, good luck. Your worship attendance numbers may not be that high online either. So uh, for us, it's been uh, thinking outside of the box. It's been making sure that everything that we're doing is intentional. And this is what, um, and all of these things connect, right? From worship to pastoral care to Christian ed to ordering life of the church. It's all about intentionality. And so I remember the first staff meeting I had with my team uh, when we knew we were about to close down and uh, we had a Zoom call. We didn't meet in person. Uh, and uh, I gathered them together and I said, look, here's what we've got to do. Everything that we've always done, we need to throw it out of the window because it really doesn't matter right now. Mm -hmm. And that was a very difficult thing for me to say because I didn't want to believe that. Right. It's, so you talk about leadership. I didn't want to believe that we had to throw out everything and re rethink what it meant to do worship now fully virtually, because there was always kind of this thought that, Hey, we were going to be back soon. You know, four weeks this is going to blow over six weeks. We're going into week seven. Mm -hmm. We have not hit a peak. I want to, I want to just want to be honest and real with everybody. We have not hit a peak. I don't care what leadership in this country is saying. We have not hit a peak. Uh, my wife works for the CDC. I know we had not hit a peak. She's answering inquiries from all over the country. Uh, she and her team, we have not hit a peak. There, and even if we did, there's not a vaccine or a, or, or a treatment that is viable. And you know any vaccine, just look at H1N1, SARS, whatever you want to look at, it takes at least six months in the best of circumstances for trials and testing and all that. Um, and these are what medical experts are saying. This is not just Kevin. Uh, so what does it look like to prepare for, for this reality for the next four months, five months? And so that's what I prepared my team for, that that's where we're looking. We're looking that what if, you know, we can't get back to normal. Mm -hmm. So with that in mind, that's, that's kind of the, the mindset from which we're operating, Hemi. Um, and how we've been planning. And so this is what we're doing. Uh, we meet every week. Uh, in fact, when we get off this call, I got a meeting with my team. We plan out worship every week in a different way. Um, sometimes we do it two or three weeks in advance, uh, depending 
on what the so for Palm Sunday and Easter, we obviously had to plan a lot more in advance because we had a lot of moving parts. Uh, we thank God have someone on our team. We have a director of technology on our team, uh, a social media person, a videographer. And so uh, we get all the content uh, in terms of, and I'll talk more about this when we do the preaching segment, uh, but everybody has a deadline. And if you miss that deadline, your part doesn't get in. Mm. Minus the preacher. But, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> everybody has a deadline because we've got to get it in, get it edited so that mm. Sunday morning it can be pushed out. Uh, and then how do you organize all the pieces leading up to that to let people know what's coming for Sunday? So the, the big word here is intentionality. Uh, it's been very intentional. Um, and you say, I don't, I don't know if, you know, if I definitely uh, lead differently than anybody else other than I'm just honest with people. And I think sometimes we get caught up in this web of dishonesty, even with ourselves. And sometimes you just have to just tell your team how it is and you've got to be honest with yourself. And the true reality is we're going to be in this for a while. This is our new norm. This is our new reality. And so we've got to learn as the church of Jesus Christ to make disciples in our new reality. This is not anything that's, uh, that's unique to the body of Christ. We've always had to do this. We've always had to adjust, always had to adapt. So uh, I would say intentionality, honesty, and very careful planning uh, uh, around worship. Mm -hmm. and I'll I, yeah I think I heard you say that you also took a look at what the online product would look like as opposed to what it would look what it look feels like when you're actually in the space yeah. and made some adjustments did I hear that yeah absolutely so our online product looks significantly different than our in-person worship product does mm -hmm. we didn't try to mirror it I mean, it, there was no way to do that. We tried to get as close as possible by including some of the same elements, but we're in a virtual world now. Uh, mm -hmm. So whereas a service would have run an hour and a half, you know, we get happy maybe two hours. Now we're going 45 minutes to an hour. Mm -hmm. um, we've got a song. So if you're talking about order, we have kind of a pre-service, a song, a welcome offering, um, and then another song, sermon, and then we're done. And that's that's our worship experience. I'm gonna tell you why we do it that way. Because the reality is, and, and perhaps some of you have seen your own online um, engagement, you've probably gotten more views now in your online engagement than you have probably when you were in the physical building. I'm gonna tell you why. Number one, it's not just people who are watching you live. It's people who are gonna come back and watch you. People who are gonna share that video. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, Live, you may have, I mean, a couple thousand people that have viewed the video. By Monday morning, it may be 5,000 or it may be. Uh, the other thing I want to just want to caution us to realize is that now we are, we have all become, whether or not you want it to be, we've all become public theologians. Hmm. All become public theologians. Everyone's content is now shareable. And now everyone's content uh, can be up for rebuttal. Everyone's content uh, can really be, be proven whether sound or not. And so I, now that we are in a virtual world, you will find out whose content has been strong or has not been since they've been preaching and teaching. Uh, you are now without an audience, and I know this may come up later in the preaching moment, without an audience, we must produce strong content because mm -hmm. now you ain't got folks talking back to you or, mm -hmm. or, uh, you know, saying amen. And now you can't do the, 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 the visual engagement. So you, your content has to be strong and it's got to grab people. And Kevin, think, let me just yes. interrupt you once. That's the whole purpose of our two year cohort. I just want to put that in that that's, that's what we've been talking about this time. So mm -hmm. go on. <laughs> So your content has to be strong. Uh, and then you have to think about your end user. Uh, this is what we've done. We, we, you have to think about who's going to watch me, who's going to watch this service, watch our church. Know that you're not just preaching to, uh, know that you're not just preaching to your uh, congregation anymore. 
that's those days for at least the foreseeable future are, are, are gone. You're not just preaching to your church family, you're preaching to a broader audience. And that's what you have to realize. So I know it's good to talk to your church family, uh, but what we've done just is always included when we're talking to the Cascade family, we always say Cascade family and friends. Because now you've got a lot of friends showing up to church. And so if you've always hoped for, you know, having more visitors come to your church, well, you got your wish. They may not be there physically, but they're virtually and they're watching you. Mm-hmm. Yep. I appreciate that intentionality because you envisioned, like what, when you were talking about envisioning the end user, you, you're, you're talking about how do you meet the spiritual need of that specific person Absolutely. And, and, and the breadth of those people that are, that are coming on. Uh, also the integrity question of your message and the depth of your message. And, um, you know, those are, um, it takes, I don't know if you found this, but uh, it seems like it's taking a lot more uh, emotional and, and thinking, uh, you know, uh, energy to, to actually produce what it is uh, that we're putting out um, to the public, as you say, dub to public domain. It is. And, and I don't want to, I don't want to gloss over the fact that this is a pandemic that we're living in. Mm-hmm. Right. I've never lived through a, a, a local national pandemic like this before. This is the first time that I, most pastors have never had to lead through a pandemic before. Mm-hmm. So I want us to to really live in that tension for a moment and say there's no one size fits all here. Uh, it is literally leading every day with, you know, your your feet on the ground and your head in the clouds, praying and asking God for wisdom and guidance by the spirit uh, to make the right decisions and to do the right things. Leadership, I believe, and I've just discovered this leadership is really proven and known in moments of adversity, Mm -hmm. not when you're on mountains. Mm -hmm. You know if you are an effective leader when you can lead your people through a valley or when you are Moses and you've got Pharaoh behind you and you've got a Red Sea in front of you and you're praying to God because you don't know what to do. The people are complaining. They want to have everything their way. They want to go back to Egypt and you've got to be the calm in the midst of the storm when everybody's panicking and they're thinking the world is about to fall apart. And you've got to stand in that space and hear God say to you, well, what's in your hand? And in your hand, there's something powerful. You've got the word. We've got the word of God in our hands. We've got the spirit of God on our side. And so I think, and no, not I think, I know people want their pastors to lead right now. If there was ever a time for pastors to be pastors, it's now. Mm-hmm. I yeah, Kevin, so let me ask you a question. Address on that very note, because Cammie's uh, topics have all been about leadership. So as you, you said it's time for the pastors to be pastors. And, and on the point of leadership, when you live in a state that the governor says the churches are now open, how can you speak about that and your leadership team? How, what decision did you make and how did you come about it with your, your leadership team? How did you lead uh, having gotten that note, that announcement from the governor? I mean, it was a no-brainer for us. I mean, it makes no sense right now to, to open. I'm going to tell you why, it's, why it made no sense to us. Um, because when it hits you personal, personally, then you realize what's at stake when you reopen. We've had about three, we've had four members who've died from COVID-19. Hmm. Four. And having to stand at the graveside, because we've on, we're only doing graveside services now, mm-hmm. and be with those families, and to know the stories behind, well, we couldn't see our loved one before they died. We couldn't even FaceTime them. Um, there's a nursing home uh, right down the street from our church that we did ministry at every week. We, were their ch- we are their church. And I don't know if you all uh, have read the news, but this 80% of the residents at the nursing home contracted COVID-19, 80%, 17 deaths. One of whom was one of my church mother, church mothers when I was in seminary and I was a student pastor at a small United Methodist church. And she was 
the uh, SPRC chair there. She, when Ashley and I got married, uh, Miss Mann, Miss Ernestine Mann, she was a prominent educator here in Atlanta. Uh, she helped coordinate our wedding and to know that she died and two days later her sister died mm. of this virus. Uh, so when, when you have politicians who place commerce, money, and money above people, we're not ready to open. The CDC is housed in Atlanta. Mm. And they have constantly and consistently said, we are not ready to reopen. We need more social distancing. We need to be aggressive. And we have on any given Sunday, 1,500, 1,700 people that are gonna come through our church on a Sunday morning. You know, and to put my people at risk, it, it just wasn't worth it. It's not worth it, especially when, you know, we're doing well online, uh, we're reaching more people online, uh, we're stabilized financially, uh, you know, the Lord is blessing us, we, people are joining the church. Uh, so we really had, had no incentive to go back that early. However, I know there are some churches that are smaller in size and they're wondering, like, how are we going to pay the bills? You know, people aren't gathering, our members aren't giving online, that's probably the plight of most churches. And I understand that. I mean, I, I get that reality because again, I'm a pastor, but we have to always live in the tension of protecting our people versus doing what we want to do and, and protecting our folks. Diana, it was, it was paramount to me, to us. And, and I'll let you know, we're going to go back when it's convenient and comfortable for everybody to worship in the space together, uh, f you know, free of fear <laughs> of contracting uh, the virus, however long that takes. Mm -hmm. uh, so, okay. I think you jumped into my next topic, um, which was pastoral being the pastor in the midst of this. A great question. I appreciate that, uh, uh, Reverend Masters, because um, you know w we oftentimes have to be the the voice um, of reason <laughs> and and the pastoral voice in in our settings and in our contexts. And you obviously stepped up to do that. Um, talk a little bit about what other decisions you've made that have been pastoral decisions in um, your, your present uh, position. Yeah, connection at this time is important for everybody. Mm -hmm. So I wanna put that as one of the essentials. Uh, I'll give you a couple essentials. Number one, intentionality. Be intentional about everything. Don't assume that everything is just gonna be like it's always been. You have mm -hmm. to be intentional. Communication huge right now communicating with everybody mm -hmm. if you've got a staff communicating with them communicating with your leadership communicating with your people communicating with your audience in an ongoing manner and i'll talk more about that when we get to the preaching component um and uh, the third one is connection people desire connection right now albeit virtually right we've got you know 30 nearly 40 people on this call and we're looking at zoom has become our best friend mm -hmm all of us should have bought stock in, in Zoom and Netflix or something because Zoom had the, just, and I'm, I'm about Zoomed out, but I, lo I love it because it is an amazing tool when you're, when you're doing something you enjoy. Now, some of the you know, things that you really don't enjoy doing, you gotta Zoom them. But this has been amazing, right? Because you can connect. And even when we can't physically see each other, we can connect, um, at least facially. So connection, one of the, major decisions that we've made is uh, we went down our well and this took a long time uh, but we're st and we're still doing it we gather together all of our lay leaders we have a lay leader and we have four associate lay leaders um, and our leadership team our pastoral team and our staff and we've got we got about 20 volunteers to help with this from our Stevens ministry uh, and this is another use your ministries right you have them for a reason use them Stevens Ministries, Care and Concern Ministry, we took our role and they split up the role and they've just been going down calling people every day. Uh, and so our goal is to, uh, to, reach all, <laughs> to reach all of our members with a phone call. And we, this, it's been very successful, not because we've been able to reach more people, but let me tell you why. There was one, one day our outreach coordinator called uh, an older gentleman of our church. Nobody had heard from him. He was on our care and concern list. And this was about two weeks into the pandemic when folks were really kind of wrestling to go get groceries and, and paper products, tissue, uh, 
et cetera, paper towels, et cetera. And nobody knew that he didn't have any food in his house. Mm. Had we not made the intentional effort of calling, just randomly calling our members, and this man, this gentleman's what, 85, he lives alone and you know, not very mobile. We don't know what could have happened to him. Mm -hmm. uh, but now that we know, you know, we've, we've, we've gotten him groceries every week. And that's another thing, you know, we've connected with uh, Hosea Feed the Hungry. We've connected with Atlanta Community Food Bank. You know, we're giving away 500 boxes of food every week. Uh, because we know that that's a significant need in our community. And we've got a community fund set up just for that purpose, which has continued to grow. Uh, so I would say intentionality, um, caring for your people right now, make the phone calls. Uh, we're all at home. We're all, you know, take about an hour a day, connect with, I've tried to connect with at least 10 people a day in some kind of way um, so that I can just say, hey, look, it's pastor calling. I just want to see how you're doing. You guys need anything. Everybody's good that will go so far. Mm -hmm. um, we've also done, uh, during Holy Week, uh, I did a prayer call every day, every day at noon, but I still have a weekly prayer call every Wednesday morning, 6.30 a.m., I'm online. Uh, I've expanded mm -hmm. it now to social media. Um, you know, we had about 700 people call in just to that the, the call this past Wednesday because people crave connection. Um, one of our associate pastors is, has formed a, and, and you can do all these things right free, freeconferencecall.com, you set up a conference call line. Um, our outreach pastor has set up what's called connections. And these are just hour long slots every day of the week to members who, if they just need to call in and have a conversation with somebody, you know, just to say, hey, how is it with your soul? Where are you seeing God in the midst of pandemic? And he has those conversations with them uh, daily. And so you would be surprised uh, to know how many people are struggling and wrestling with this thing. Or you may not be so surprised. Um, we know that domestic violence is on the rise right now because uh, people are, are home. Uh, parents are struggling like us with their children to not only be parents, but to be teachers. <laughs> and that's, uh, something else and so people need a an outlet and oftentimes the pastor is that outlet uh, we in terms of giving i know people are worried and wondering about that how do you continue to uh, accept donations from people uh if when you're social di socially distancing well these are important things uh, because our church is closed we have our staff show up every thursday uh so we have a very skeleton staff so it's you know our finance director uh, it's a couple of office staff, um, and they show up to receive all the donations that have been mailed in for the entire week, um, because you still got to function and operate like that. So those are decisions that we just had to make that were, um, critical. Uh, let me see what else, I anybody else, it, uh, is that kind of answering along the lines, Kimmy, of what you're, what you're thinking about in terms of critical decisions? Right. Um, yes. And, and, you know, you, you're, it's interesting for you to point out the fact that when you are reaching out, and I think so many of us sort of were just receiving, right? We're receiving our people into the building, but now we're going out to them and we're connecting in ways that are, um, you know, real and people's, you're hearing about people's lives and they know their, their pastor and the people of the church who are um, Christ to them. And then they become Christ back, right? right. So, so uh, faith becomes alive. And then, you know, you kind of, and, and that intentionality of having systems and strategies that make those connections is really important. So thank you for speaking to that. I'll um, say a word then, really quick about funerals. Sure, yeah. Uh, that was the most difficult decision uh, mm -hmm. that we had to make. Mm. Uh, because in when you love people and you want to be with people in their, in their grief and you can't, uh, it's painful. Mm. It, it really is. It's tough. And so what we decided to do, um, and really we, we got some help from this because this is the only thing the funeral homes are willing to do at this point. And that is graveside services, 10 or less, 10 or fewer people, uh, that are spread out. And we've made the commitment that uh, after 
when we come out of this that we'll have memorial services for everybody. Uh, I, yeah, we'll have memorial services for everybody. Uh, it's going to be a lot uh, from, because I mean, we've had about, not just from COVID-19, but, you know, other people who just died. Um, you know, that's going to be a commitment, but it's something that you just have to do for your people. It's, it's what's required of us, right, as pastors. And that's what we do, what's, what's required of us. The most difficult, um, one of the most difficult uh, was, was when Dr. Lowry died. Uh, Dr. Joseph Lowry, uh, who the Dean of the Civil Rights Movement, my personal mentor, uh, pastor of marriage of our church. And, you know, not to be able to have like just an amazing funeral for Dr. Lowry, celebration of life, and having to, you know, lead his graveside service with, you know, 10 people and family over a Zoom call. Uh, it was very meaningful. Uh, don't get me wrong, I thought it was a, a great service. Um, but, you know, this is, this is Joseph Lowry, right? Mm -hmm. So we're going to honor him in October. I mean, you know, we're going to have a, a huge celebration of life for him because that's what, that's what he deserved. Uh, but that's just one of the, and, and most, and let me affirm this in you guys too. Most people would never know uh, how painful that is for you as pastors. Uh, this is a deeply intense, deeply painful time. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's tough particularly when you love your people. Uh, and it hits the pastor just like it hits the people. And so, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to have a counseling call here. I'm just saying it, this, is, this is serious stuff. Uh, and so don't, don't be afraid to reach out to those people in your inner circle uh, who you have to just bounce some things off of to say, look, this week was tough. Um, you know, in a span of a week, you know, we lost Dr. Lowry. We lost another very close member to COVID-19. Uh, and we just had a lot of other stuff going on. I mean, you're talking about, are you going to have to furlough people? Are you going to have to, you know, look, you don't know what your finances are going to look like. Uh, you know, those are very difficult moments. And so uh, I hope you have an outlet uh, as a pastor. I hope you have somebody to pastor you uh, during this time. I just wanted to lift that up. Amen. You know, I appreciate the fact that you're also lifting up the, 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 the truth that every created person of God should, uh, sh shall be honored uh, uh, in, their, in the memory and, you know, spending time having a service for them to honor them is, um, it, it honors the life that God created. And um, to not say, oh, it's too late, or we're not going to, or we passed the time. It's never too late to honor God's people. So I appreciate your decisive <laughs> um, you know, way of dealing with this um, that does that. So appreciate that. Um, I wanna talk, um, I've got about t 10 more minutes for my part. Can I, I wanna honor that? That's fine, that's fine. Um, uh, you talked a, a little bit about uh, offerings and, and that's ordering the life of the church. Um, and are there other areas of ordering the life of the church that you have been thinking about working on um, that are connected to your work? You yeah. Uh, you've made? Well, uh, let's start financially. Uh, okay. I, I know that, look, at the end of the day, the church, uh, salvation is free, but ministry costs. You know, we, we need, we have to still support the work of the church. Uh, that is, it is what it is. And we have to do that in the season where people are being laid off, where unemployment lump numbers are through the roof. Uh, and people are, are really living in this season of uncertainty. So how do you continue uh, to operate in, in your kind of space um, with, not all the resources that you would have if you were meeting physically and all was well in this wonderful economy uh, that we have. So what we had to do is we had to, uh, and I've never had to do this at a church before. And uh, I just thank God I have dynamic leaders who are, and this is another thing, all this goes back to the decisions that we make as pastors early on to do things and get systems in place you know you have a strong foundation and strong system, not when it's breezy 
and beautiful outside, but when the storm hits, mm -hmm. when the storm hits, you know whether or not you've got strong systems in place. So here's a, le here's a lesson. If the storm hits and things collapse, then you need to change your systems. Mm -hmm. Or you need to look at getting better people in these positions who know how to help you weather the storm. I promise you, Kevin is not weathering this storm by himself. Mm -hmm. No, I've got a team of people around me who have been through the storm and the rain and they are able to say, look, we made it through worse. We're gonna make it through this. So let's just adjust a little bit. And that's what we've had to do. We've had to adjust our entire budget, um, you know, in the first three months of the, and so now we are on a week to week budget where we are looking at everything week to week. And we have our, our finance team analyzing where we are, what it's gonna take to operate, what it's gonna take to do this ministry, pay staff, all these things week to week. Uh, and it's worked great for us. Uh, it's allowed us to really dis to discover some things that we needed to clean up uh, and also to become more efficient in some areas. So I'll just give you one example and I'm being transparent. So we, most churches, and we still did it too, was uh, we, we did, uh, you know, paper check requests. Like if you got an expense or something and you want to fill out a check request uh, to get it paid for, et cetera. Well, you can't be in person now and things still have to be done. So uh, our director of technology, who is, you know, is dynamic, uh, created a, an online check request process and has trained all of our leadership. And we will be going for, with that from now on. And it has just sped things up. We get things paid, paid, paid faster. Uh, it's just, it, it's been phenomenal for us. So, but that was a, a system that was deficient. And so I, I want to suggest during this time, we need to look at what our deficiencies are. Again, intentionality, pay attention, you know, pay attention to what your deficiencies are. Uh, what are your strengths or your weaknesses? And during this time, you have an opportunity to get better at those things. Most of us in our ministry would have never had seven weeks of a pause. Mm -hmm. This has been, well, whereas I hate to, hate to see a pandemic, I think for intents and purposes of the church, reimagining, rethinking, reprocessing, revisioning, taking a pause and just being able to stand still for a while, to look at our ministry has been, for us, it's been a blessing. And uh, I want to suggest that you do the very same, that you look at everything uh, that you've been doing well, that you haven't been doing well, and you be honest with yourself. As leaders, and I'm going to get back to uh, in a minute some decisions that we've had to make, but as leaders, I think even personally, you should spend some time taking an examination of you, of your ministry, uh, of your gifts, of, you know, I've found some deficiencies in my leadership, that I, things I need to work on, things that I need to get better at, things that could help even further the mission of, of the church. Uh, and I had to be very honest about those things uh, because we can think we're so strong and the best pastors, you know, since sliced bread. Uh, but the truth is we all have things we can work on. And I thank God for this season of pause and reset. Uh, so that's been the first thing. We, we look week to week. Uh, the next thing I will say uh, in terms of, of ordering the life of the church uh, is when you think about coming back, we still have property. And so we're gonna be worshiping in facilities. So do you have a facilities plan when the church opens back up? And we talked about this at our staff meeting last week. When the church opens back up, do you know how you're going to roll people back into the life of the church? What's your rollout plan? What's your regathering plan? So let's say for example, because here's what I believe is gonna happen. I can't, don't quote me on this. I just, this is just Kevin following the trends and following the facts. If in fact we went from being able to worship however many people we could worship down to, what was it, 250, then down to no gatherings larger than 50, then no gatherings larger than 25, then no gatherings larger than 10, I can almost guarantee you that when we're able to regather, we're not gonna be able to have 300, 400, 500 people in the space at one time. So um, I'll just say for a church like us, 
when we have, you know, twice, three times that, how do we provide worship for people when we can come back? So we're already thinking about a facilities plan for that, right? Um, can we, do we have to go to four services, five services to accommodate, you know, 200 people at each service? Uh, how do we space those out? Do we go to a midweek service? You go to a Saturday service. How is our facility prepared to handle that? What is it going to mean for the cleaning of the facility? Have you done a deep clean of your church? This is an airborne virus. Um, there was a story that came out that a guy was in a restaurant. He sneezed and the virus spread through the air ducts and other people got <laughs> contracted the virus. Uh, are your events being cleaned out? Have you done a deep clean of your sanctuary? We have our building cleaned every week, even though we're not in it. Because you know, like if you go on a long vacation, you come back, you got stuff everywhere. Uh, just because you're absent doesn't mean you gotta be absent from taking care of your grounds. Um, it's, the, it's the space of worship. So make sure that you do that and make sure you have a plan in place, an incremental worship rollout plan for when people come back, uh, you're already prepared. Uh, so I would offer that uh, just as some things that we've done uh, to, to put things in order uh, because, you know, and it's always changing, right? You've got to be adaptable too. So let me just, yeah. just add that in. So I'm going to uh, like this pass it off, but I want to say um, before I do that uh, the cabinet has been working on things to consider as you go back into your settings. And so that's going to be made available to all of our pastors, but it'll be on our website. And I've um, just been reading through, I've been reading through all the possible things that people need to be considering and um, putting together also what the governor um, has put out uh, that are regulations for our state. So um, that's going to be likely be made available to everybody, um, if not this afternoon, tomorrow uh, morning. And, um, and then also, um, just on that same topic, uh, Owen put in the chat that the, um, his center is going to be having a Thursday at 1.30 prosponding to the COVID-19. I'm hoping uh, that the, all of that piece can be made available as people are looking through the checklist. Oh, that's so, awesome. that's yeah. Awesome. But thank you so much for um, answering these questions. And I think you, you wanted to touch a little bit on uh, the Christian education component. Um, and so um, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to like pass the ball over to you and let's ask you to respond to that. I need to jump on this other one, but it's been a blessing for me. To once again, like I said, you didn't di <laughs> you didn't disappoint me at all in uh, your fresh perspective and your intentionality and your creativity um, and empowerment of people. And thank you for the work you do. Always good to see you, my friend. Thank you. Thanks. Blessings to you. So, Dr. Muriel, before you go into Christian education, uh, I, I want to just kind of. Um, think about getting us back. We're 30 minutes off of our tentative schedule that was in pencil. So as you talk about it, we're going to talk a little bit about that and then bring it up later uh, as we are rounding up. I want to uh, get into one more piece on leadership. So let me give you time to respond to that and then we're going to move our agenda. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll be brief. Christian Ed, keep doing it. Uh, if you have not created classes, keep creating them our Christian education on Sunday morning, we had uh, nine, I think we have nine um, Sunday school classes, Bible study classes. All of them are still meeting. Our goal, again, intentionality, our goal was to make sure that every class still met. Mm -hmm. Every class leader got set up on either Zoom or Google Hangouts. And each person got their own login credentials they were able to share those login credentials with all their class members. Our classes have grown exponentially since we've been online. Mm. People can do them from the comfort of their home <laughs> in their pajamas or whatever they want to do and not come to the physical space. Same thing for our meetings. All of our meetings are online. Uh, we get great results. Uh, I am. And then as the pastor, of the church, I would also encourage you to do specialized 
congregation-wide studies. So on Wednesday evening, uh, I do a segment on live called Stay in the Course. And uh, last week I did a panel on the Ministry of Mental Health. This coming Wednesday, uh, I'm doing uh, a panel with uh, Dr. Jimmy Abington of Emory and Dr. Roland Carter on the power of hymns in times of crisis. Mm. And so that's going to be our Wednesday night uh, and tying in scripture to it. Uh, and I'm doing, beginning tomorrow, actually, a seven-week congregation study on uh, the book of Revelation and the seven churches of Asia Minor. It's a Zoom call, so it's not me just, you know, uh, talking and, and, and teaching that way, but it's a Zoom call. We capped registration at 200, and we've hit registration, uh, and so we'll have, and so that's just a, another touch point of connection with your people, right? Um, just an opportunity uh, to, uh, to continue the education, uh, really to expand it. Uh, so be creative with that and make sure that all your classes continue. That should be a goal that they don't stop meeting because a lot of people find community through their Christian education, small groups, Bible studies, et cetera. So thank you. Thank you. Those are great suggestions. So as we get ready to move into our, our next um, section, before we, we leave this, I wanted to honor that um, Dr. Ron Patterson, Dr. Michael Bowie, and Derek Jacobs are also on the call. And um, they did a whole year with Dr. Muriel with uh, leadership and um, preaching and, you know, iron sharpening iron. So as it, I'm just going to give the three of you a chance to just make a quick response to some of the things that he has mentioned and some of the things that you have put in place um, already in the churches for the North Texas Conference. So Dr. Patterson, it looks like you're moving forward. Do you want to go first? Hey, my friend. <laughs> we can't hear you. You're muted. We can't hear you. <laughs> good morning, Kevin. How are you? Hey, good to see you. Good to see you. Hello, everybody. As soon as I put my earphones on and started listening, Kevin, you were so wise. I broke out paper and pencil, and I've been writing ever since. So I said, S. Diana, I said, iron sharpens iron. You are giving me life. I mean, I just am like a sponge. This is fantastic. But at the park, we are continuing to do Zoom. Sunday school is on Zoom. A lot of prayer calls. My husband and I started a prayer online, a Bible study. He named it. It's called The Pastor and Her Sidekick. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> but so we are staying in touch. I spend at least an hour every day on the phone calling people. And those phone calls make such a big difference. Mm. Our online giving is amazingly doing well. Um, our seniors come by with their check uh, during the day and just hand me checks. So it is gratifying to feel that love. The, the, the most exciting thing we're doing in Hamilton Park is that once we saw all these jobs being lost in Dallas, we said we know there'll be extra amounts of hunger. And so we launched a feeding program to meet the hunger in our community. Everybody's hungry, the adults, the children. And so now we feed about a thousand people every week, uh, a hot meal, grab and go style, mm -hmm. get it and out. So they're in the building, you know, le le 60 seconds or less. We love you, but go. But mm -hmm. it's a hot meal, it's nutritious. And the people that have come through just show the demographic of hunger right now. We have sheltered and unsheltered. We have mm -hmm. black, white, Latino. We have entire families, parents and little kids coming in. Mm -hmm. But the ones that always get me are the teenagers. When a teenage boy, you know, with his basketball comes in for a hot meal, that mm -hmm. says you are really hitting something powerful. Now our challenge, and I hope you all can help me with this, is to how to leverage all those people that came through for that meal. What do we do to minister to them once this is over? That's what we're trying to figure out now, but we are, but we are, the, the park is alive and well, and thank God, and thank you for this great phone call. Thank you. Okay. Dr. Bowie? Yeah, hey, good, good morning, Kevin. Hey, good seeing you again, man. We, uh, <laughs> hey, Dr. Muir preached our 87th anniversary um, 
on yesterday. And man, folks still tweeting you and talking about you. And matter of fact, I may use that if. That, that <laughs> if. But anyway, I digress. Y'all go check it out. Um, powerful, powerful message yesterday. But um, we, we really, um, our discipleship, our pastoral care, our administration meetings, they're all virtual. Um, I have a couple of folks on the call on, on the team. Our team is on this call today, so I thank God for them. They have really stepped up, man. They know what it means to be nimble and flexible. Um, we've had to adjust. Um, I, I think one thing you said, um, I think initially, at me personally, I thought this would last maybe, maybe about a month. And, and I think now, um, realizing we ended for the long haul, it's been a major adjustment. And I think um, this whole process is it, not me. It, it's my team. So we, we're doing, they're doing a great job. I, I would say this Sunday, um, not just because you preached, but this was probably, I believe, one of our best um, experience, worship experiences. Um, technologically, things flow well. So we're really focusing on making sure that we get that tight. Um, I say it all the time, we're not the only game in town. Uh, it, it, if our stuff is quote unquote ragged, they're gonna go to, uh, to, to to Hamilton Park. Matter of fact, the village just built a big old building. They may go to the village. And uh, so like, it's not competition, but we wanna make sure that we're um, doing new stuff. So I'm even thinking this week, uh, as we talk, I'm thinking I may do so. And I got my team on the phone. I think I wanna do something on the couch. Um, just talk to folk, uh, conversation from the couch, uh, from, you know, in times of crisis. So always trying to do something different. Um, but one thing, um, I really, I, I don't think my, my pastor of outreach is on the call, but really I think now, um, we have started meeting the needs of our, our, our senior saints, but, uh, I know it's time for us to really, really get out into the streets and do stuff. So we still, um, we're doing some stuff, but I think we really have to get it in overdrive because I, I think uh, Cammie said it best and you said it, being intentional. And I'm going to say this, and I'm going to close, man. This, um, doing ministry like this has probably been more exhausting. Mm -hmm. um, I want you all to Google uh, how Zoom calls, it's, it's been proven, mm -hmm. how Zoom calls can be so exhausting. Yeah. So, so little tip for some of y'all: when y'all see me do this, that's a way to really get your breath. Mm -hmm. Because with, when you pitch it all, you have to always be on, and yeah. that's exhausting. So, so we we do Zoom calls. My executive pastor's on the call and uh, on on this meeting today, and you know we all do Zoom. I we have our. Um, I, I think I see Minister Latasha. She's right there. She works with our women's ministry. She's doing our intern. She's doing a major job with internship. So, so it's a lot going on. And um, I, I don't know, man, it's, it's, it's exciting time. I, I think um, they say these are the best of times and worst of times. So the good thing about this, we have a blank canvas and we can paint it however we want. And mm. you can't mess it up because it's never been done before. <laughs> so we all start new churches. So... So that's that's what we've been doing. I appreciate your leadership, and um, we're pressing our way through it. Um, so giving, I would say, uh, as Diana, I think Reverend Mass, our giving, I don't know what it's looking like today, but we hadn't dropped off majorly, but I, I, I believe it's going to start picking back up. And uh, what I've been doing, like like you said, like uh, Dr. Patterson said, I've been starting to call a, a, a lot of my members um, not realizing how much they appreciate that. Um, mm -hmm. And even some of them, believe it or not, uh, you have some members, I mean, I text them, I call them. So even text sometimes go a long way. So uh, when they start talking more on the text, I just call them, you know. But other than that, um, this has been um, some interesting times, but it's exciting. Okay. And I appreciate your leadership. And it's good being with my, my former cohorts. Um, yes. so, Absolutely. All right. All right. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. Kevin, good to see you. And hey, uh, man, good to see you smiling this this afternoon. Good to, this <laughs> afternoon. <Yeah>. He's smiling. <laughs> He's smiling. <laughs> That's an inside thing, y'all. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, good. I'm, I'm smiling more these days. <laughs> good. <laughs> I appreciate your insight, and you know, things are. You know, this, this pandemic kind of hit us in an interesting season, as uh, Dr. Bowie mentioned. We are. Uh, finishing up a building about 30 days away, 30, 45 days away. So wow. there's a there's a high possibility when we finish our building, we won't be able to worship in that 
in mm. that building. So, uh, but, but we've been able to utilize that uh, uh, to still build and gain momentum because we're constantly using social media to push out what's going on with the building. As a matter of fact, we just put brand new pictures up yesterday. It went viral all over social media. So we're actually using that as an opportunity for us to, to gain some energy and, and some momentum and, it, and it's working. Um, so, but it'll be interesting to see you know, how this thing plays out five, four or five months from now when we finally get, able to get, get in there according to what you're saying with the CDC. So, uh, but you know, everything is, is holding pretty strong. Um, our giving is, is sustaining about, you know, it's, it's pretty strong. It hasn't really dropped off that much. Uh, maybe a little bit here and there, but this past Sunday yesterday was very strong. So, um, you know, people seeing the building and all that, they know that we have to continue to be supportive. So that, that really has uh, been strong. So I, I resonate with a lot of stuff that you, uh, you, you have, the insight that you have given us. And it really is making me think even more about a relaunch, pro, uh, relaunch plan and uh, with my team, mm. I, I like you have a very strong leadership team. And, and so it's not just me, but it's a, it's a group of us. It's a team of us who are really working to keep this day moving, um, you know, each and every week, uh, calling members. I do call 10 a day. That has been very helpful. As you said, and Dr. Bowie, uh, that just goes a long way just to have a brief conversation. You know, how is it with your soul? Mm. As a matter of fact, we're doing a Zoom. Uh, it's called this coming Sunday at five from five to six. All members are are uh, able to get on Zoom to do a, what we're calling a "How is it with your soul" uh, hour, where people just and like you said, connect. People want to connect. And although I'm completely zoomed out like everybody else, it's just the only way that we can uh, really connect. And and so we're looking forward to doing that. We have a drive-through food bank coming up on our parking lot, our new parking lot. Uh, we're going to mm. provide 250 prepackaged meals for, for uh, families in need. And so the city of DeSoto is pretty excited about that. So just trying to find ways to continue, uh, you know, building momentum and meeting needs. And, and uh, just, I, I'm, I'm excited about this. It sounds crazy. I'm not excited about the pandemic, but I'm excited about the opportunity it's given me uh, to look at my leadership, to spend more time with my kids, which is something I haven't been able to do and my wife as well, and, and then really just kind of reflect on, on the church and, and where God is leading. So I'm using it as an opportunity um, uh, to, to, uh, to you know, really look at my own leadership and spend some quality time, which I had not been able to do before. So it's, it's a blessing in disguise in some ways. I'll stop there. Okay. All right. Thank you. I thank all three of you for uh, your leadership in the North Texas Conference and sharing with us what you're doing. So uh, for this part of the, the call, what we had hoped to do is have Dr. Mary talk about leadership. I think he's done an excellent job of answering Cammy's questions and talking about leadership. But before we transition into the, the preaching part of it, I wanted to know if there are any callers, and I know I'm running a risk by opening it up, but um, we are really wanting to get uh, your questions answered uh, with him being here, uh, almost like present. So if there are any uh, questions that you want to um, ask him about leadership before we transition, this would be your time. You can unmute and uh, ask uh, Dr. Muriel your question. Okay. I, so um, you were talking about the pause and I was wondering, um, we're gonna be exploring this Thursday about using this time to take churches through a visioning process. Um, uh, what, um, how are you engaging the leaders of your church and to kind of use, use this liminal space to think about the future? Yeah, great question. Um, I don't know how much visioning we can really do right now, aside from uh, how is this going to impact the things that we weren't doing? How can we do those things better? Yeah. We're we're in a pandemic. I, you know what I would ne what I would not like to happen is, and what I've tried to avoid is thinking. To first of all, we're not gonna we're not gonna get away from who we are. Like we have a vision, we know what we're doing. You know, our, our vision is to be a light in the community and around the world through discipleship, service, social justice. 
we're still living out that vision. Our why is still going to be there. Now, what we do is obviously going to change. I, I will say going forward, we will obviously be working to implement more online Bible study experiences and extending that into our Christian ed. So in as much as we're, we're doing visioning, it's really about how can we keep on doing what's working for us right now? Like, and how can we keep that going in our churches? Like, we're not going to change our entire approach to ministry uh, because it's working. In fact, for us, it's our approach to ministry that's, that's helping us maintain. Um, I think what conferences are going to have to think about, if you're looking at more of a larger perspective, I think conferences are going to have to think about how do you help churches heal uh, from this? Uh, how do you help pastors heal? Uh, sometimes, and, and I'm not saying this for any in conference in particular, uh, but I've, I've discovered sometimes there can be a disconnect from the hierarchy and those who are on the ground doing the work, um, doing the in-church work, the local church work. Uh, and sometimes I think the, the institution believes that pastors and churches can move to places they're not ready to go yet. And I think there's going to have to be a, a significant time for pastors and people to heal. Um, yeah, doing a lot of what uh, your son's doing right there. A lot of hugging, a lot of <laughs> talk, talking. <laughs> look, we understand, Owen. Look, I, look, we get it. <laughs> we get it. Uh, it there's going to have to be a lot of time. If, you know, I would urge conferences right now, um, not to add anything else to, to the pastor's plate, but I would urge conferences right now to look at uh, more of how do we care for our clergy, who we're going to rely on and depend on to lead our churches after through this pandemic and after it. That's if if that were if that were me, and it's not me, y'all. You know, y'all see things I don't see, or you. Uh, but uh, I, I I chair our clergy effectiveness committee here, and one of the things that I see uh, from clergy that we have to review is that there's a ton of brokenness there. Uh, and there's a lot of hurt there that has gone unaddressed for a long time. And we can't expect our pastors to be effective in vision with our people and leadership. Um, you know, so, uh, so what does it mean to have more of a, a pedagogy of care uh, and moving forward in that care so that you can vision and you can reimagine? That's what I would, if, if I were in that space, I'd focus on heavily. Um, how do you how do you remove the financial burden or at least help with it uh, of your churches uh, and thinking even even beyond that if you're thinking about six months from now uh, you know how do you how do you help churches that don't make it or pastors who, who don't make it uh, we're seeing deaths of individuals in COVID-19 this thing continues. How do you deal with deaths of churches? Uh, I just think we have to, there's a lot to think about. Um, and if I were, if I were in conference leadership anywhere, I would put a hedge of protection and care around my pastors right now. Mm. Yes. Yes. As much, as much as I could. Uh, and because every day, Every single, and I understand that we have to vision and we got to look forward to leadership, but every day we got to think about what it means to live week to week. What it means, to live, I don't know what's going to happen next week. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this is a, a week to week thing that every week it, the dynamics may change. I don't know if that was helpful or at all. I just. It was. Thank you for that. All right. Appreciate it. Both um, as we think about how to help our local churches and how the and how conference leadership um, giving some insight to what's going on with our churches. So I appreciate both those pieces. Dr. So, so, Dr. Muriel. Uh, yes. Can so, I, oh, sorry. So, uh, Brandon, uh, B, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. okay, um, thanks, Joshua. Um, Dr. Muriel, connected to some of the things you said in that point, um, one of the things that's happened in this is I thought I was – I thought I was going to finish out a series on Zoom um, and it ended up transitioning into another um, sort of more private support group um, of the young clergy. And in that, so I never finished, that series finished and then we started another series that went public. 
but from that um, just was led to continue sort of that talk and support. Um, and some folks came in that aren't necessarily local. Um, they're young clergy folks that I know and ended up, I'm sort of facilitating, not sort of, I, I ended up, I'm facilitating um, sort of a support discussion and network of young clergy that are working in churches. Um, and this past week, um, two of them shared um, that they're uh, basically me um, as a facilitator, um, I'm sort of on suicide watch with them. Um, like they, they verbalize the fact that like this is not, they're not okay. Um, they're managing day to day. They can't think about week to week, right? Um, their leadership doesn't really know. Their leadership thinks things are fine. Their congregations think things are fine, but they don't know. And so can you talk just about um, care for pastors, <laughs> um, care for our peers, care for our loved ones, um, care as leaders? Um, I don't necessarily have any pastors, on, you know, like that I'm managing, but other people on the call do and you do. So could you just lend some of what you are feeling and knowing and possibly doing in this moment connected to that? Yeah. Uh... I want to be honest and transparent during this time with you all because I feel like I can be. Mm -hmm. And I know we always, we talk about collegiality and wanting to be collegial uh, with one another. Uh, but I think what we have done, and, and I can only speak for within our denomination based on what I've experienced. I think what we have done is created the illusion of collegiality and not a reality of it. I think of all the focus groups and the, you know, ordination groups and all the small groups and all the, the meeting that we do at district meetings and all that's supposed to cur curate this experience of collegiality, trust, and support. Uh, but one of the issues that we see pervasive among clergy, and I'm going to go deeper, Miranda, with your question, is a sense of competition that is unhealthy especially if it is if it is presented as collegiality mm. and that's just a, so i want to i want to first set the framework for my answer by saying by asking by then posing a question how can i be collegial and caring with and for someone with whom i'm in competition mm. so I think we have to start there. And I'm not saying that all clergy are in competition, but I just think our system has set up that unhealthy perception. And so it's very difficult for each for people to call one another sometimes. Um, and so I'll just say that first and foremost. Um, that's why I go back to this term intentionality. Sometimes you have to be intentional about having people you can reach out to who may not be in your clergy circle and uh, who may not be in your district or in your neighborhood <laughs> or maybe on this call I don't know um, I just I just think it's important for, for us to have all type have, have those types of outlets um, so what does that then mean for the care of the pastor well one of the things that I'm that I've tried to do during this time and I want to offer it to you uh, as a, a different method of care is coaching is linking up with someone who has been in the throes of ministry and maybe near retirement or uh, has led and has gone through almost every scenario situation as a pastor that you can imagine. And then you just link up with that person and, person and ask them for a season to coach you. Uh, I'm about to do that now because I want to uh, even go through more uh, and understand more about certain points of ministry. And this becomes a person for me that, uh, that has served perhaps a larger church that has understand some of the personal dyna personnel dynamics and people dynamics. And then it becomes someone uh, with whom I can converse and experience that type of care. Um, so uh, that's what I would say. I would say pursue that. Um, the other piece I think is conferences have to give clergy the space uh, to care for themselves. Mm. And because we are in a denominational system, 
Uh, I think I read something yesterday. Uh, was it from the Iowa conference? Let me see. Was it the Iowa conference where the bishop is giving her clergy three days of mandatory? Yes. Okay. Of mandatory rest uh, and and just kind of time to break away. I think that's great. I don't know if I would extend that through Sunday, but I I think that's I definitely think during the week you give me like a Tuesday through a Thursday or Friday. Look, I'm I'm good if you could take care of all of that uh, because I, I just also want to want to be clear that your people still want to see you on Sunday. Mm-hmm. I don't, look, they don't care that you're at the beach. They don't care that you're tired, that, you know, you've, you've been with, at funerals and with families all week. These folks have been taking care of kids, working long jobs. Some of them are unemployed. They need their pastor on Sunday morning right now. Mm-hmm. They need you. Um, I have committed. I will try my very best not to take a Sunday off during this pandemic um, because my people need me. And they need you. But during, in the meantime, you know, you do have to care for yourself. So those are the three things, Brenda, I would offer is consider someone outside of your immediate peer group for that care. Uh, Consider coaching, you know, someone who can really help to um, help you work on your deficiencies. Uh, And, you know, the third one I would say has to be a conference responsibility. The conference has to give the pastors time and space to do that. So, so, um, Josh, sorry, Brandon. Uh, okay. So I, one of the things you're, you're, well, you named something right before Brandon's point, which I think feeds into her point. Um, is we there are a number of churches that probably won't make it after this is over. Um, and more so, I think the reason the North Texas Conference has a Black church initiative is because the Black church vitality is not the same as a North Georgia conference. Um, and so, so what, what do you do with that spirit of competition, if you will? Right, the fact that you probably have more Black bodies than you have Black spaces. Um, and I think one of the things that, that I find very interesting about this conversation is and I'm, this may be named at the beginning of the call. I'm sorry, I was late. I had a three year old I bought with me to church, but um, she, but here is, uh, Kev, you're like this is your second senior pastor appointment, right? Um, and Cascade is one of the largest black churches in our denomination, and so we are all sitting here, uh, receiving wisdom from the mouth of a millennial. Right, who has been tasked or tr- or entrusted with um, a significant assignment, um, and I am I am struck by the imagery, and also I would like to you know probably hear your perspective on how that's played out in your in your annual conference, um, like it's because I think we we're we're treating this time as if like we're going to continue to, um, and this is this is not a shot to anybody or anything, but it's like. We continue to entrust the same people um, as experts when the truth is we're not experts anymore. And this is a season that we're all going through for the first time. Um, and so, so I'm, I, I'm, I wonder about, about that, how other annual conferences are handling that. And also, uh, like I said, how do, you, how do you create collegiality when the truth is many people may not have appointments after this, right? Well, I'm seeing healthy places to be. Um, so those are two questions. Sorry. You know, and those are questions that I, 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 I will say to you that I know where my limitations are. <laughs> and I am not afraid to ever say that I don't know. Mm-hmm. I do not know after this season how the church is going to look. I don't know how conferences are going to deal with pastors uh, who are pastoring churches currently that may not make it. I don't know um, how our denomination is going to look and because I have a lot of things to think about, right? I have one, two, three, three individuals on my team at our church who are in the ordination process. What is it going to look like for them to be ordained? And then if they're ordained, where are they going to be? I mean, yeah, they're at Cascade. We're going to try to make room, but uh, you know, 
the, the truth is the, the well only runs so deep. Mm-hmm. And so I don't know, but here's what I do know. I trust God. Mm-hmm. That's what I do know. And I have, and what I have discovered and experienced from the Lord, because again, we're still in a spiritual enterprise, right? What I have experienced is where I don't know what is going to happen. God knows. Now I'm talking to a bunch of preachers. I thought I would get at least three or four amens right there. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I thought I would at least say, look, I, if I can't get y'all to say amen, I don't know what we going to do. Dr. Bowie, I don't know what we going to do if I can't get the, the preachers to say, <laughs> look, if I can't bust out a, a Romans 8, 28, for, for we know that all things work together for the good of them who love the Lord and those who are called according to his purpose. I, yeah, yeah I, I don't know what I'm gonna do if I can't get it. But you know, that's, that's the truth, man. Uh, and, and I realize that God puts us in certain situations for, you know, uh, just like Esther for such a time as this. I, uh, I don't think that any of us are where we are by mistake. I don't think I'm serving this church right now uh, in a season of global pandemic by mistake. Mm-hmm. Uh, and what can I do individually to use my voice and you know all that I've learned and all that I've gleaned to share and help help others and then this is a shared burden right so how are we as churches extending ourselves to help other people so that those are the things we have to look at Um, I do recognize that uh, that and Cammie brought this up earlier I think now is a time for prophetic leadership and we talk about prophetic leadership and this is what this whole cohort's been about and all the sessions that we've had and we've talked about what does it mean to step out and tell forth what the Lord has said? What does it mean to be on the margins of leadership when other people are looking, looking at you and not understanding why you're doing what you're doing? What does it mean to be out there and be that voice for the marginalized and tell your people that we don't know how are we going to come through this? But we know that God is on our side. And as long as God is on our side, we will come through it. Uh, you know. Hey, 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 yeah. Ken. Um, I, I want to follow up real fast with uh, Joshua's question. And I think uh, for everybody listening on this call, when you talk about courageous leadership, I think it's tied in with humility. Oh, God. Yeah. And, and one thing I realized uh, when we started the BCI process. I had met Kevin prior to this whole process and I knew he was much younger than me, but I knew I had something I could glean from him. So I think when you get past your ego and your age and realize it's not about you, it's about kingdom work. Mm -hmm. I think um, that's when you can get past it, Joshua. So what I realized, I mean, just going back yesterday, you know, when we brought Kevin in via, you know, technology, I told the congregation, hey, it's going to be a word. This brother can preach, you know, and, and I sell it and say this. I believe the system has created this, uh, which is totally unhealthy. But I think when you realize the bigger picture that it's not about us, it's mm-hmm. about uh, seeking to save that which is lost. Right. And I think, uh, Kevin, Josh, I'm Josh's, Josh, what am I? I'm his preaching cohort. Stuff I learned from you that I'm pouring into them now. I love but he it. says something, y'all, and, and, and Reverend Masters, I think Josh is on to something. In this process, if we think about this, y'all, at the foot of the cross, the ground is level. Yeah. There's no big eyes, no small U's, no rich, no poor, no black, no white. And the beautiful thing about this, God is raising up new prophetic leaders out of this crisis. Yeah. And it may be more millennial. So uh, b- baby boomers, uh, I'm a Gen Xer. We have to humble ourselves because there's plenty good room, but everybody has a divine assignment for this next season. So I'm clear about that. And I think we all have to be clear on this call, who we are and whose we are and who God has gifted and blessed for this next season. And, and I, I'm clear about, you know, and I'm gonna be honest with you for a minute. I'm like, I'm, I can coach and lead Kevin, but guess what? It's not about that. Mm-hmm. It's about humbling yourself and being sensitive and discerning of what God and who God is using. So I think the peace that not only I have, but we all need to have on this phone, it can lessen suicide and lessen hateration when you know who and whose you are. So I'm just gonna chill on, I'm gonna gonna stop talking on that. Now we're back. So let me kind of help us to regroup as we get ready for the afternoon. 
we uh, are all in the position of ministry. And one of the primary purposes of our, two primary purposes of our cohort has been uh, prophetic leadership and sermon preparation. Uh, our cohort members have turned in sermons that we have read and evaluated. And um, I know that the cohort members from last year are remembering those days. Um, so we're going to uh, shift now and move into a time of sermon preparation to focus on uh, what it's like to preach to empty pews. Um, if there's anyone that is here that's preaching to full pews, you can just kind of tune us out right now because that means that uh, you're not in this group. But we could not not do this piece because that's what we are about. And I think that that is the preaching prep is something that all of us uh, need to be about. Even those of us that, that's not serving churches, we are uh, asked to preach from time to time in the different uh, churches. So sermon prep has been really important. And as Dr. Bowie mentioned, Dr. Muriel preached yesterday for um, St. Luke's 87th anniversary, and I would lift that sermon up. You can go and look at it on their webpage. It's recorded. Um, but sermon prep and sermon delivery is one of the things that he shines at. He may not be good at everything, but sermon prep is, is, is and sermon delivery is, is one of his really strong suits among many. But I just want to just very quickly tell this story. Uh, I was in Atlanta for another meeting and went to Cascade. I uh, have a sister there that's not a biological sister, but a sister in Christ. And I heard uh, Dr. Muriel preach. And I was really um, in awe about that because the preaching that I really uh, tune into is if it's biblically based. And I thought, hmm, I was going to another church for the second service. And I thought, let me just see if he can do this again. So second service, he preached, and it was just as motivating and inspiring. And after worship, I did talk with him, and I said, how do you, how do, you do this kind of preaching? Uh, he said, it's, it, it talked about biblical-based. And as he talked, preached at St. Luke yesterday, um, virtually, uh, his sermon talking about the woman with the issue of blood, and her issue was the... Uh, Quarantine. So I don't want to go into that sermon that much, but um, Dr. Bowie and, and Dr. Muriel, you can tell that I listened to that, that sermon on yesterday. So how do we do sermon preparation with the focus on preaching to the empty pews? Uh, I, want, I, I want Dr. Muriel to talk about that, but I want to also allow time for you to ask him questions about what he's doing and then our last hour we're, will be uh, spent on doing ministry with the poor. So let's talk about sermon prep. So I'm passing it over to you, um, Kevin. All right. I want to argue that even though we are not physically in the building, uh, the pews are as full today as they have ever been. Mm because now you're preaching to a worldwide audience. The World Wide Web is your pulpit, is your, excuse me, is your congregation. Your pulpit may be your dinner table, your couch. I'm doing a series right now called Lessons from the Living Room. And uh, I'm literally preaching in our living room. And <laughs> that's been an adjustment, but it's, uh, it's had some very powerful moments. Uh, I would say that your voice uh, can go further now and it brings to light what uh, 2 Timothy uh, 4 2 uh, says, Preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction that our, our work never stops. No matter where we are, we are preachers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And no matter what season we are in, uh, in the sanctuary, out of the sanctuary, no matter where we are, we should be preaching and reaching the world with the gospel of Jesus. I'm encouraged, I will say, because uh, right now I've not, not seen such a large concentration of preaching on social media and online at one time 
I mean, can you just imagine with me uh, how many people are every day being reached with a message of the good news of Jesus? If that is, if we're preaching the good news, now, some of this other stuff that we hear, I don't know what it is. But for those of us who preach the good news of Jesus Christ, we are reaching a large number of people uh, with the message of Christ. And so I think that's important for us to acknowledge that. Um, so I want to hear from you briefly before I get any deeper. How has it been for you preaching? Uh, those of you who've had to preach consistently, and even those of you who just may have done a sermon or two, how has it been uh, not being able to do it from the comfort of your pulpit on Sundays? I think somebody's talking, right? Is that Jim? Jim, I think you're on mute. Okay, Jim, we can't hear you. He's going to unmute himself here. Mm -hmm. There you hey. go. Oh, death the bomb. Okay, yeah. Yeah, our faith is certainly an incarnational faith. And, and, yeah. to, uh, and, and this is wonderful to be together virtually, but oh my gosh, I miss my people. I miss, uh, and you know, we're the... Um, Hugging us a bunch of people, and uh, you know, it. I I was a um, I was a theater major in undergraduate graduate school, and and I liken it to uh, we're not actors, of course, in ministry, but on the stage playing to an empty house, or our NBA NFL playing to no one in the stands. It's it's a whole different uh, it's a whole different game. It's hard, I think. Somebody else? Thanks, Jim, for your honesty. Uh, I would say, uh, Dr. Muro, the first, it was like a shock. And I think I, I talked to my uh, the cohort last week in this preaching cohort. It hit me, and I'm the mind of the word that I that the world is my So I'm always intentional of not just talking to the members of St. Luke, but literally talking to the world. So what I envisioned the second week, and um, Reverend um, Linda Mayberry is on the call. She's my executive pastor, and also uh, Pastor George Battle. So once Hughes, when I did my first, I guess, pre-recorded, you know, what I envisioned was that Jesus was actually and knowing that I was preaching, and we always say this, we're preaching to an audience of one. We don't preach for amens and shouts. We preach for transformation and change. And as long as I'm pleasing Jesus, I know that sounds real Christianese, but I'm saying, Lord, I'm preaching to you so you can take this word and change, change the world. So now, man, it's kind of like I was a journalism minor. So new stuff is coming out, and, and, and it is natural now. Uh, of course, I want to see a head nod or amen every now and then. But when you see, um, like, Pastor Latasha kind of um, facilitates our live stream stuff. So you hear, you see responses via, you know, Facebook and live stream. So you know you make an impact. But I realize now I'm preaching to one person, Jesus. But I know I'm going to connect with the world. So I'm good with it. Now. It was hard, but I'm not going to say I'm a pro at it, but... I think I've got it down and it can get better, but I'm, I'm enjoying it. I want to say that I'm enjoying it. Also, we made a pretty smooth transition to online because my admin has an iPhone 10 and he's able to edit, take my sermon and edit in the music piece and, and then put it on our website. So it was seamless. But I tell you, um, doing Facebook live preaching is amazing. I love the feedback. So that part has gone well. I, I want to add, talking about pastoral care and taking care of yourself as a pastor, after those first five weeks of me preaching, I was burned to a crisp. And so I was happy to step back and let my associates preach. And that's been something, some, some self-care for me to just step back and let somebody else carry that for a little, little while, gave me time to regroup and then come back again. Excellent. Excellent. Anybody else just want to provide that space for you? Yeah, these are, these are all great thoughts. Um, I want to suggest that you are now people's uh, internet pastor. You ever considered yourself that if you want to add a new title to your uh, business card, add internet pastor. <laughs> Stay. 
that your people, that you got a lot of new members right now, your people's in there, Pastor. And they're going to start referring to you as that. The longer we stay in this, the more of a normal, and the normally longer you stay in anything, it normalizes, right? Children of Israel are in, uh, in exile in Babylon. You know, Jeremiah 29, you know, the prophet says, look, you're going to be here for 70 years. So you might as well build some houses, have kids, marry them off, plant vineyards, uh, because I'm going to revisit you after 70 years. I need you to normalize in exile for a while. And I, I look at this as we are normalizing in, in exile. And God did not tell us to stop building. He says, keep building, keep building your ministry, keep preaching the word keep reaching people for Jesus. They may not walk down your aisle, but they can fill out a form online and you can call them and they can become an e-member. Uh, you may not be preaching from a pulpit, but you can get on a couch. You can go outside next to a tree. You can, you know, you can, you can set up a table with a green screen and you can proclaim that Jesus lives and people will still hear the gospel. The Lord never told us to stop growing. He just told us to go Matthew 28. And so I, I think, now we have a greater opportunity to go and the preacher is still still the most powerful voice in society i believe i think pastor preacher prophet is still the most powerful voice in society when we use our voices let me say that again when we use our voices uh, coupled with the word of god i still think we have uh, the greatest influence so yesterday uh, I preached a sermon uh, that uh, I titled, Mama Didn't Raise No Fool. That was the title of the sermon. And uh, it was a response sermon because, again, preaching is contextual as well. And so it's incarnational, but it's also contextual. You have to preach for your context. So I knew that the people tuning in to Cascade were going to want to hear what my perspective was on our governor reopening Georgia and how that was related to, you know, how it is that we continue our ministry as Christians. So uh, I went to the Proverbs and I went to Proverbs 18. And when you read Proverbs 18, uh, it's in that section of that, what I call the couplet section, the nuggets of wisdom section between Proverbs 10 and 29. I mean, in no distinct order, you can just go in and you can just kind of pick some nuggets of wisdom in these Proverbs. It's not like, Proverbs 1 through 9 or Proverbs 30 through 1. And so I picked out Proverbs 2, Proverbs 18, 2, Proverbs 18, 12, and 13, and Proverbs 21, where Solomon is juxtaposing the difference between the foolish and the wise. Uh, and uh, he talks about, and when you get to verse number 21, life or death lies in the power of the tongue. How it is that when we speak foolishly, uh, our words can be destructive and can cause death. When we speak wisely, our words can bring life. And so I talked about my upbringing as a, you know, as a proud Mississippian. I'm from the deep South. Y'all, y'all in Texas, y'all that's Southern, but Mississippi is deep South, right? We, we, we deep South. Is Texas even considered South? Yeah, they are. Okay. Oh uh, yeah. With that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I had to do it. Oh. Mississippi is oh. deep South. We're deep South. And, uh, you know, in, in Deep South, in Deep South, we had a lot of sayings growing up, uh, things like, you know, when, when you weren't, when, you know, when somebody's trying to talk to you and they weren't getting through, they would say things like, I feel like I'm talking to a brick wall. Or when you were moving real slow, you know, grandma would say you're moving slow as molasses, things like that we just said in the South. And one of the things that we always heard growing up that I continue to say that even to this day is mama didn't raise no fool. And so I talked about how, how it is that that deep Southern saying was conventional wisdom for how it is that we should use our intellect when making decisions, particularly when we are in positions of authority, and how it is that those who govern from positions of authority must always speak wisely and not foolishly, because if we speak foolishly, then it can cause death. We speak wisely can bring life. And so I juxtapose that with, you know, opening up too soon and all that. But for my context, it was appropriate. It's important for us as ministers of the gospel to use the scriptures to convey a prophetic message for the times in which we live. 
right now there's no need for anybody to be preaching about you know prosperity and all this other stuff no we are in a debt we are in the wilderness right now right people we are in a pandemic people are dying every day and so people want to hear your voice in the midst of the wilderness crying out saying everything's going to be all right right um by faith uh if it were me and you just Diana, you asked me my approach I've, I've approached preaching in this season uh, to connecting uh, with faith and, you know, keeping people on top of their faith. Uh, I really tried uh, to connect uh, a lot with um, the Old Testament and particularly what it means to come through a very difficult trying season. Um, this coming week, I'm exploring what it means to really trust God when you can't trace God and looking at uh, Abraham and Isaac uh, on the mountain and how it is that Abraham didn't see uh, the ram in the bush until God changed his perspective. And in the season of pandemic, we don't know where the ram in the bush is, but God is even changing our perspective in this season. So it's important to approach preaching in this season in a way that your people can connect um, the preach. And then I want, I want to also say that they need to see you vulnerable. Uh, that's, that's something we don't do very well. Preachers don't like to be very vulnerable. Uh, but I think in this season, your people need to know that you're wrestling with this just as much as they are. And a part of the wrestle is uh, I, I'm getting an amen from John. A part of the wrestle <laughs> is like, we can't see you, we can't be near you. And a part of our faith is, you know, not with, uh, not, not keeping ourselves apart, right? You know, forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. We, we need to, we don't want to forsake the assembly, but now we can't assemble. Uh, I think people, your people need to know that you miss them, even though you may not as much. Uh, I think sometimes pastors need a break from their people. Amen. So I should have got about 27 amens. I know we got 31 people on the call. I should have got 27 amens, at least from that. Um, sometimes I think people, <laughs> Brad, sometimes I think uh, <laughs> the people need a break from us. Oh, and oh is that. Amen. Uh, <laughs> I don't think it's a bad thing that we're, that we're getting this break. Uh, I think for pastors and preachers, your people need to have an opportunity to appreciate you. And appreciate what you bring in this season. This thing has been recorded, so I'm not going to say too much about that, but your people will appreciate you. They'll appreciate you a lot more right now if you take time to be their pastor and preach sermons. People are going to remember your sermons right now for years to come. They're not going to, sometimes they may not remember what we ever preach, but in a pandemic, they're going to remember what you're talking about. They're going to remember that sermon that, you know, in quarantine day 95, and when they were ready to give it up and throw it all the way, that their pastor spoke a word and it meant the world to them and it kept them going to another 95 days. So I wanna just set the framework, not necessarily telling you how to preach, because you all know how to preach, but really the mindset for preaching is what I've tried to focus on. I've tried to put myself in the home with the mom who is working a full-time job and now who has to care for her and teach her three children in addition to being on conference calls every day and you know having to worry about whether or not she's gonna get laid off because the revenue isn't coming in uh, from, from the, the job. Or you know, for that essential worker who's at the grocery store all day and you know they've never been appreciated up until this point. Now, every time we go to the grocery store, y'all are saying, thank you, thank you. And, they're putting their lives on the line every single day, uh, you know, so that we can eat and still not getting paid a lot of money. Or for that teacher who is having to adjust because she's been teach he or she has been teaching for 35 years and have never had to do online class, online teaching. And now it's an adjustment. Um, so I'm trying to put myself in, in the shoes of the listener of the end user, that's what I call. And so I would encourage you to do the very same. Uh, you're no longer preaching to just, again, 
you're no longer just preaching to your congregation. You have a totally new following. I happen to think that when we come out of this coronavirus pandemic, that churches are going to be filled much like they were um, after 9-11, after World War II. Uh, I think this is gonna be another moment for the church. This gets back then, I think then this connects to what Owen was asking earlier about the visioning. So let's say we come through this, we get a vaccine, there will be one, we come through all this, and now you've got more people knocking at your door, sitting in your pews, because you have connected with them, uh, you know, virtually first. So the question is, what you gonna do? Now, when you come out of this, you've been preaching all these strong sermons online at the house, and you come back and your sermons go from a 10 to a six. Ain't gonna work. Ain't gonna work. That was an amen moment right there. Ain't gonna work. I would suggest that you ought to be doing your best preaching right now. You're doing your best preaching right now. It, it, we ought to have a, a preaching marathon going on right now. You ought to put as much content out as you can. Now, I don't wear people out, but you should put as much content out as you can. Take this opportunity to do some special topics that you probably would not have um, preached on had you been you know, inside of your sanctuary. Use this opportunity. Maybe some of you, some of us were too afraid to preach certain things because we didn't want to look at some of the faces of our people. But guess what? You're just looking at a camera now. So say what you got to say <laughs> and let the spirit have his way. Uh, so this is really an opportunity for each of us uh, to hone in our craft. There's another very important lesson from this to be gleaned. And that is because you are having to record your sermons. Now we started off doing them live and then we decided, you know what, we're going to, we're going to pre-record and, you know, we'll get it to, the, to our staff videographer. They'll put it together. We'll just live stream it on Sunday. Um, but it gives me an opportunity to go back and now watch my sermon because I have to review it. So whereas I may not have been reviewing my sermons before now I've got to go back and I have to meticulously watch myself because we, we're our worst critics, right? We don't like to watch ourselves preach. <laughs> and I got to go back and watch myself. You got to go back and watch yourself to say, why did I say that? Why did I do that? Why did I? And the beauty about preaching now is that if you have enough time, you can go back and correct it. You can go back and re-preach your sermon. Some of you may not want to do that, but I've had to, the other week, I, I didn't intentionally do it. But I had to go back and re-preach. I was about 25 minutes into a sermon, about to make my clothes, about to bring it home. And lo and behold, my computer, um, I, I don't know if it, it went in sleep mode, something like that, and cut off the recording. I said, doggone it. So it gave me an opportunity to go back, watch the sermon. I said, oh, I could say this a little differently. I could redo this. So I went back and re-preached the entire sermon. And... Um, Come to find out the second attempt was better than the first attempt. So these are opportunities that your congregation, I would not say this in front of my people. And if y'all tell any of my church that I went back and preached the sermon again, I will deny it. Uh, but I just want you to know that this is your opportunity really to hone in your, on, on your craft and your skill uh, by some self-evaluation and examination. Um, so I want to stop there and just really answer any questions about uh, you know, maybe form or what, what are some of the, some of the questions that you all may have about preaching that I can hone in on so that we can make our time uh, together a little more uh, effective. I have a, a comment sure. and, and that is when we're starting this back uh, in March on was it March 22nd, uh, to do this, uh, some advice that was given to me by a professional was to think outside the box. And so I, I did, and uh, like you, uh, I record the sermon, but also I don't uh, record it, uh, I mean, I record this, the sermon usually in the sanctuary, but other times like the introduction and the benediction and maybe some parts in the middle, I'll record someplace else. Hmm. For example, on one, uh, Sunday a, a week ago, I preached about uh, the the power of the resurrection, and so I went to the local power plant and spoke outside it. 
and that was recorded and then that was edited uh, together and so that was a lot of fun um owen the from our tour together the the power plant is right smack next door to salem kinzer united methodist church so i started i had the camera my my son's 18 and studying uh, wants to study film next year in college so i had him uh, record me in the back of salem kinzer and then turn the camera around and say, this is the power company uh, right here. And that was a lot of fun. And then uh, yesterday I uh, preached about the uh, importance of listening uh, to God. I used the, uh, the passage from 1 Samuel chapter 3 about Nathan, Nathan uh, uh, I'm sorry, about uh, uh, Eli and Samuel and about Samuel say, what, here, here I am and not, not listening. Uh, not, under, not understanding and so forth. And so uh, I went upstairs for a benediction to our third floor of our building where we have the control panel for our carillon. And so it goes off at noon and it goes off also at uh, 12. And so I went up there and I filmed the benediction while the chimes were going off. So that, that was kind of fun. So I would encourage others to, to do that. It, it's fun, the, the, the members uh, seem to like it and it's a nice change of pace. And, and so uh, many of you might have had times in your preaching, like, you know, man, if I, if I had the opportunity to do this on location, uh, it would be so much better. Well, this is this opportunity. So I uh, invite you to uh, take advantage of it. Absolutely. Thank you, John, for sharing that. I had a question um, more geared to uh, what you were saying about the possible um, influx of people coming into our, our churches um, because of the, the quality of preaching that we're doing. And I wondered, had you even thought of, had you been thinking about um, prepping our people for the possible uh, influx of people that may be coming into our doors because they've connected with you personally as the pastor. Uh, um, and when we do get the time to go back into our churches, you know, people miss their pastor. <laughs> uh, they want to touch, they miss their proximity to their pastor, um, to their church, to their friends. And new people may not, um, well, congregants may not as be thinking oh, we need to be ready to welcome these new people as well to kind of set the stage for the quality of preaching they're going to receive when they come in. So I wonder, had you been thinking about that? Yeah, then I push that back on the pastor. How are you preparing them for that? Everything's about intentionality. Everything's about preparation. Uh, so I think you need to be, we need to all be talking about life after this, being very intentional. Uh, and I think you need to do it over and over and over again. How do your system and all these things go back into systems, right? Uh, how do your, how does your, how do you welcome guests when you come back? Uh, I'm going to tell you a big change for us. And I'm not saying that we're going to totally eradicate it, but um, our moment of sweet, what we call sweet, sweet spirit, where we pass, it's the passing of the peace, right? We take a moment and worship and that's when everybody goes around and greets everybody. But um, when we come back, there's still going to be a lot of anxiety around social distancing. Don't hug me. Don't touch me. Don't, you know, if you don't give me six feet, six feet, at least give me four. Right. So I think we, we're going to have a culture already of disconnection, even when we come back to our church. So I think we have to prepare for that. Um, I think as the pastor, we have to be preparing people uh, to welcome. We have to be welcoming. And, you know, even if we have to say, look, uh, we're going to we are going to um, devote a significant amount of time to welcoming the people who are new among us and not saying that there are going to be a whole lot of new people there. There may and they may come for a couple of weeks and find out the church is mean. They may leave. But I think you have about two. I think you've got a good two weeks when we get back. Two weeks. That's what that's what I'm putting my mind to two weeks to capture all of those folk who may have connected with you and who may want to physically visit your church. You've got two weeks to really connect and say, and, and get your people to the place where you say, look, we've been wanting our church to grow. God has given it to us. How are we going to accept it? 
And, you know, woe unto us as pastors if we do not prepare our people for that. Other questions, other, other thoughts on that? I want to say a word uh, briefly about well, somebody. Jim, were you coming on? Uh, yeah, there you go. You, okay, there you go, Jim. Oh, no, I wasn't going to say anything. Uh, oh, okay. I thought you were, you were, you were saying something. Uh, let me say a word about uh, ministry with children. And how many of you all are offering uh, children church experiences right now? Okay, good, good, good. Uh, there are some tools out there that you can do that uh, quite easily. Um, right now, media has a lot of resources. Uh, also, yeah, right now is great. Uh, also, Google Hangouts. Uh, you can set up a portal through Google Hangouts uh, to where you can offline uh, have a teacher, an instructor come online, work with the kids. Uh, we do four of those on a Sunday, different times, and then we do uh, also one with our young adults uh, on Sunday evening. And then there's an, a devotional time for children and youth and young adults every day of the week that's led by our youth pastor. Uh, so intentionally sharing the word with all age groups, all demographics. Again, those things don't need to stop just because we're virtual. In fact, I think they can expand. Uh, so I just wanted to offer that. And the content too. The content is very important. Um, it's important primarily uh, because people still need to be able to connect with theology with our theology and because they're hearing a lot of stuff out there i still think we have we have the best theology there is out there and we need to it needs to be front and center right now um, people need to know about theology of grace and what it means to our theology about evil and how it is that we how do you reconcile and those those are deep questions that people are going to ask you is the is coronavirus an act of God? Have y'all gotten that? <laughs> y'all got that? Is God punishing us because uh, you know of our just our wretchedness, right? You know, people are asking these questions. These are things that we're hearing. Young people are asking these questions, especially, uh, and then some some of our senior members are going to ask these questions. So, how do we wrestle? How do we how do we inform? How does our theology inform a time of pandemic? inform us during a time of pandemic. I think these are very important things we need to consider as we're, as we're talking, um, as we're preaching and teaching and providing spaces for people to connect with us. Diana, can I stop here and ask some, and get some, gain some questions, get some questions? Anybody who may have some more? I've, I've had uh, just a plethora of those kind of end time prophecy uh, Hey, Jim, we can't hear you. We could a second ago. Of, of the Odyssey, uh, it, it's, God is not the instigator. God is always at ground z zero, but, but they're only to, to make all things new, always present with us, but certainly not the instigator. Um, and I know you're right. I, I, I mean, I, I, yeah, I channel surf to see what's out there and, and there's there's a lot of a lot of God blaming going on, and uh, you know you better get right, you know, in uh, these the last days, and uh, so it does give us a nice opportunity. I preach grace, and uh, yeah, I, and, and I think that's a great point. Um, you know, these end time prophecies and all that. I get that, um, but you know, the writers of, of the Bible always thought we were in the last days. Absolutely. That, Right. Yeah. So uh, they didn't know that we were going to be reading their their writings today. I mean, I think yeah. this is important for us to share with our people that, you know, these times are not unique to the world, to world history. Um, and so in the midst of all the chaos that, you know, we're still a people of faith and we need to be preaching, you know, what is sound. I just think that's very important. Just wanted to lift that. Uh, other comments, other thoughts? 
question on first time visitors. You were talking about the number of people who were coming and visiting your site. Yeah. Uh, and so how do you capture their information, connect with them, do follow up and then uh, try to connect them with the greater congregation and, um, and discipleship? Yeah, great question. Hey, is it okay if I, um, if I share my screen for a second? I want to, I want to just want to take you um, just to show you a couple of things that we're doing. Uh, I'll, I'll just go here. Let me create a new tab and, um, and let me pull that over here. Just one moment. Take some of this stuff down. Okay. Uh, give me one second. I'm going to share this. All right, let me see if you guys can see this. Open system preferences. One moment, let me turn my share on. Okay. Can you all see my screen yet? Hold on. Let me try to do it again. Okay, here. Here it is. While you are doing that, may I ask uh, to send a, a message? I don't, I'm not seeing everyone's name in the... Uh, never mind. Never mind. I answered my own question. Okay, I just wanted to share this with you all. Can, uh, if you all can see this, let me know. So when you go to our website, um, and, and this came out of a, we, we ultimately kind of revamped our website during this season of pandemic. And this is the Revelation Bible study I was telling you all about where people could register right here online. Uh, and then I did an introduction to the book of Revelation that everybody needs has to watch before, um, they uh, come into the class on Tuesday. But one of the things that we did in terms of our virtual church, we actually created, uh, our director of technology actually created a virtual church. for So people on Sunday morning, when they log on, if they're on Facebook, uh, Instagram, Twitter, uh, or YouTube, we stream to all of those platforms. But our virtual church is a, is a very unique, unique experience. And so when you log on, uh, we have, we, we put online the same thing people would get if they came into our physical sanctuary. So we put hospitality, we put check-in, we put all their, all the Christian education opportunities. So when guests log on to our site and they enter our virtual church, the very first thing they see if you're a guest is our first time guest check-in. That's just a form. Uh, I want to, this may be a Google doc. I need to, yeah, this is from Google Forms. <clears throat> very quick, all they have to do is, you know, input their information here. It captures some very important information that we use. When they click submit, uh, this goes to our hospitality ministry and they get contacted immediately uh, when they connect with our church. Uh, we probably have more people connecting through this method now than we did uh, connecting when people came into the physical sanctuary. Uh, but this is building our database. It's a great tool and it, it keeps people connected and people are logging on, you know, <clears throat> constantly throughout the week. Let me go down here. Um, we also wanted, so there are a couple of things that are important to our church. Um, one of the things that was very important and we, we didn't want to lose this piece was our bulletin. So every Sunday morning, our church members get a bulletin. And we wanted to keep that, albeit virtually, so they can get the bulletin uh, online. Uh, it's it's an abbreviated uh, bulletin, but they can still get it. The other very important piece to our church, uh, to our members, was the prayer list. On the back of our bulletin, we have a list of, you know, dozens of names of people who our members pray for, they call, they contact, they send cards. 
so it was very important for us uh, to keep this active. This is just a Google Doc. It's kept up by our pastor of pastoral care. Anytime someone gets sick in the hospital, uh, they die, these names go into this list. There's just a link that's embedded uh, in the form and it's always live, right? So it's always kept current. So we have those who are you know, being healed in the nursing homes, rehab facilities, those who are being healed at home. And then this was a very important uh, piece of the bereavements, anyone who's died in our church so that people can send them condolences. Again, this is a living document. So if I type, so if I go in and type something on this document right now, because I have access to it, it'll populate uh, onto the website, which is, you know, which, which helps us tremendously. So we don't have to keep sending emails and documents back and forth, just a Google doc. Uh, and so I, I think Google docs are free. Uh, this was an, this was something that we added so that people could connect. Let's call our virtual grand hall. Grand hall is our um, lobby, our narthex, if you would. And so what people can do, people can record videos of themselves and they can upload them. Uh, this was a video of my daughter and I. So we can record that through the virtual grand hall, post it, and people can respond to it. So like, here's a family uh, that responded. Just let me click it. Oh, I gotta download the app. But yeah, here's a, here's a family that responded when you can see this little bubble here, and then they sent us a message back. It's just a, a way for people to connect um, virtually. Then when you go in, so you can join, you know, you can go in live and this is our live stream, <clears throat> which is, and, and you notice where the live stream is placed. So it's placed right next to our giving options. Um, so that one of the things that we've been trying to do is to track uh, our clicks on our live stream with uh, those clicks on giving, which over the last several weeks has correlated and has, uh, and has increased. Um, and so when you get down to, and again, each thing has a flow. So people come into the worship service, hospitality. They enter worship in the sanctuary. They have a time of giving. And then we have the invitation to Christian discipleship. So if you want to join the church, if you want to become a member of Cascade, uh, if you want you know, to receive Christ, or if you want to join our church family, uh, here's our, our new member intake form. In our intake form, uh, I recorded just a new member welcome video. Uh, website for visiting our membership page for signing up for membership and to come to know Jesus Christ closer in your walk so it's just a touch point right um, and all they have to do is indicate which service they're joining from get their name email address within 24 hours uh, and fill out this form within 24 hours someone contacts them from our team and uh, we guide them through the same process that we would uh, for membership uh, if they were uh, physically with us. We always want people to tell us about the experience, you know, in worship. And, you know, this is kind of how we curate our experience on Sunday. Then after worship, uh, we have our young people and here's their hangouts. So the gathering hangouts each Sunday for students, young adults and parents after the virtual worship service. So all they do is to click here to join. It goes to Google Hangout. Uh, it goes to, you know, a time where, you know, they can, they can just have their time of fellowship. Uh, but it's proven to be very helpful for us. And, uh, you know, all of that came as a result of very intentional conversation and review and looking at everything week to week so that we could make sure that we were, we were uh, getting those touch points for visitors, for for first-time worshipers uh, and for people who wanted to join the church. I hope that was helpful. I, you know, yeah. It was, thank you. You just add to that, uh, Kevin started off by saying, just go to the website. So if you want a copy of those copies of those forms or 
or want another look at those forms, uh, they're on the Cascade um, website. Yeah, everything's there. Mm -hmm. Are there any questions about the forms or uh, things he's covered uh, so far? Any questions? Um, how your church might be able to do any of this? So we're gonna we're gonna move to our ministry um, support. But before we do, I'm gonna ask Owen. Um, because I know he's always ready to, to talk about this. <laughs> he's he just, you know, um, is ready. So going by what we've covered so far, so far, this would be a good time to announce what's happening on Thursday, how you can connect what it's about, uh, the time and everything, and then following him, we'll go into our ministry with the poor because we all have them in our communities. We all have it even more now of the pandemic. So um, our center has made up a word and Owen will tell you that, that word. Uh, so Owen, let's get, have an announcement about Thursday. Thank you. Uh, this Thursday, 1.30 p.m. is going to be the Center for Church Development uh, weekly Zoom meeting. It's entitled Prosponding. Uh, and we were, we've been debating about what we were talking about doing, and we've been in the throes of responding and boldly adapting to uh, the reality of the COVID uh, crisis in, the, in our country. But we are starting to see both political leaders as well as the chat that's going on among pastors about um, starting to look forward. So as we're, this Thursday is gonna be all about looking forward. John Thornburg shared a, a, uh, an article about first level courage is that immediate response and stepping up to the plate amid the crisis. And he talked about stepping into second level courage means taking the time to, to step back and reflect who do we wanna be on the other side of this? Um, what is God calling us to uh, as we move through this season and into uh, seasons to come? And so John Thornburg is going to be with us from Texas Methodist Foundation and also one of our peer clergy in the North Texas Conference, as well as Mark Meyer. Mark Meyer is a consultant nationwide with the, the Unstuck Group. You can go to the unstuckgroup.com and check out the, all the resources that they have. But Mark Myers, who's their leader in vitalization efforts in the church, is going to be with us also about um, uh, moving from responding to prosponding, which is the, the word we, we made up because there wasn't a word that was capturing what we were trying to, uh, trying to communicate. Mm -hmm. So we hope y'all can join us this Thursday at 1.30 p.m. Okay, thank you, thank you. And you wanna tell them how they can find the link? Yeah, I mean, if you're on Facebook, there's an event page, uh, just look up prosponding. I'm, positive since we made up the word it is going to be the only one there <laughs> about prosponding uh, right. and also I'll copy the link on the on the chat here okay thank you <laughs> I know that that's important for them to know how to um, join on the link because as this call has go gone on people have uh, text me to say I, I, I what's the link I can't get on so if we know where the link is that's also helpful so one of the things, as we all know, that we are involved in is we're having people that are in line for food bank, um, becoming a food bank recipient that have never, never lost their job, never been without food. Uh, it's, it's really a, a hard time. And so um, Sharon talked about, um, Sharon talked about uh, feeding over a thousand each week. And so she's doing that on a regular basis. She saw that down the street, the kids were getting food from the school, but parents weren't getting food. And so that was what helped to spark this. Um, so we all have people that are in need. And so how do we as the church particularly the United Methodist Church, which is a part of our theology. How, how are we reaching out? How do we do that? 
and um, Dr. Mario has a new magazine. Has, many of us may have um, newsletters, uh, but they have a magazine that is about all the kinds of things that they have done. And one of the things that I just happened to be at church and at uh, Cascade one Sunday, they bought new tennis shoes for children. Uh, and I know Kay will appreciate that. Um, as a child growing up, I never had a pair of new shoes on the first day of school. Never had a new outfit on the first day of school. And uh, I'm so glad that I was able to make sure that my children did, whether they needed it or not. Kids need that. And so they have a program called Souls for Souls. Um, so they, they do that and, and do that well. But that's not the only thing just back to school that we are um, concerned about right now. We're concerned about, you know, all of the things that's impacting families and they have so many things that they do. So I'm not asking um, Dr. Muriel to just give us a long, long list of what they do because we can't do all the things that they do. But there's not a church that's represented on this line, on this call that can't buy um, 10 pairs of brand new tennis shoes for children that may be in your neighborhood. And you don't even have to worry about what size, what color, what kind, there would be a child at that school that will be that size. So I, I just want to give that uh, as a call that we can't say we can't do it because there's something that we all can do. And I know you can't say amen, but in the African-American tradition, we thrive on amen. So just kind of thumbs up or something that we can, you, you, you're you hearing me. Uh, so I want to lift up that. Amen. Um, yeah, amen. Yeah. amen. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So I just want to lift that up, that when we talk about doing ministry with the poor, uh, I want to really push this idea that we don't do ministry to them. We don't just tell them what they need. We do ministry with them. We walk alongside of them. We, we uh, are there with them. And so uh, I know that Cascade is doing a lot of things. So I'm going to ask, um, and I've already, you know, I've already asked Dr. Muriel about this. I want him to talk about some of the significant things, the way they're doing ministry with the poor at Cascade. And then he's going to pause and we're going to have questions um, on um, things that you may want to have more idea, more knowledge about, or you might want to talk a little bit about how can I implement this or just ask a question about a kind of ministry that you may have been considering but I want to spend some significant time on how to do ministry with the poor is theologically sound. They have always, Jesus said, we'll always have the poor with us. Okay. So it's, it's biblically sound. And as I um, continue to call Kevin friend, the things I've noticed uh, about what he's doing, I just think that other churches need to know about that and be a part of that. I want to welcome uh, Reverend Andy Lewis to our call today, our director that is um, in charge of that, that very important ministry for our annual conference. So welcome Andy to the call. So Dr. Muriel, uh, tell us, I know that Atlanta has no poor, right? Y'all have, y'all don't have any, any poor folks. <laughs> so, um, but on that note, what a, would you just jump in here and talk a little bit about how you're doing the, the ministry with the poor? Yeah, a couple things. Uh, first of all, you, you all probably could, could really school me on a lot of things that you're doing. Uh, you know, we don't have the, the fix to everything. I think, uh, again, ministry is contextual. So the work that you're doing is uh, should be lifted up is very important. Um, I think our care for the poor and ministry with the poor uh, should emanate out of a care for people, period. Uh, and if you don't care for people, then chances are you're not going to minister to them or with them. Uh, it's just, you know, Jesus had, the Bible always says that Jesus had compassion upon them. You got to have a heart of compassion and to think outside of your own uh, 
personal uh, sphere of comfort, if you would. Um, we put into our vision service, uh, discipleship, service, social justice. Those are the three things in our vision statement that we take seriously. There, we call them the three pillars of our church. That uh, our church is almost kind of this Trinitarian uh, idea that our church stands on this Trinitarian pillar, these service, discipleship, social justice. We take service very seriously. Um, and I think all churches should. Uh, I think we have to, in, particularly during the season of pandemic, we have to think about, think differently about who the poor are. Think differently about that. Pre-pandemic, the poor uh, could have been those people, those people, right, that we always say we are those people. Um, no, they're our people. <laughs> our people who would beg for money or would be homeless or would be, um, you know, unemployed, et cetera, uh, who could not provide the physical means of survival for themselves or their families. Um, I think at any given time now, it could be one of our closest members. It could be someone in our ministry, in our church. It could be someone on our executive team. Uh, we are all at this point susceptible uh, to becoming poor. <laughs> I just want to be honest about that, be real about it. Um, the poor, you know, Diana said, you know, the poor will always be among you. For us, it's about taking, starting first with our members. Who among our membership needs help? And how can we help our members uh, who are in need? We've done that through what's called a community fund for a number of years. This predates me, uh, but we collect an offering each first Sunday uh, for our community fund and for our outreach efforts. We think it's, a, it's an important enough, uh, and it comes out to be about 10% of uh, our budget every year, in addition to our apportionment. This is, this is money over and above the apportionment. Um, so we're, we're going out the door. If it's about 10% apportionments, it's about another 10%, 10 to 12% uh, in just service dollars. So we well over, you know, so it's important for us to do it. And so I want to, it's, it's good if you have, set aside funding so that you can do ongoing mission and ministry with the poor. I mean, I think, you know, Jesus said where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. Well, if you don't put any treasure aside to do any ministry with the poor, then, or those, you know, who need assistance or need help, however you want to categorize people, um, then that's your heart isn't there. I think you have to put dollars uh, where your heart is. So without getting into kind of too many things that we, we, we're doing, uh, listing them, um, we've, we've honestly tried to, in this season, to protect our members and uh, to continue social distancing. We tried to provide more support and funding to organizations that are doing the work, and then we'll send volunteers there um, to help and assist. We've had to even rethink how it is that we are, we're doing um, outreach. Uh, the other last was it last week we gave away 500 boxes of food this week we'll do it again um and this is what i here's where I, our strong point has been in terms of giving it hadn't been talking about hey we need y'all to keep giving because we got to support the church or we got to pay bills we got to pay staff people are getting laid off they don't really care about that <laughs> okay i was just gonna be honest people don't care about, what people care about is when I give to my church, are you going to take the money and you're going to help somebody? I know you got to support staff. I know you have to support overhead and operations. But when I give you this tithe, are you going to take this money and you're going to help somebody with it? So when we started uh, broadcasting to our church that, hey, look, this week we gave groceries, a full week of groceries to 500 senior citizens in our community. And we're going to do it again next week. We had not only enough money to do that ministry, but we had more than enough to give to operations, right? Because people give to projects. People give to ministry. They don't give to budgets. They don't give. And we can say all we want and we can, you know, we can try to, theor uh, we can try to use theory towards it all we want, theorize it all we want, but people give to ministry. That's why people give to United Way. 
you know, that's why they give to the Boys and Girls Club. That's why they give to the social organizations because they know that they're doing something with the money. People don't give to salaries. Well, at least our people don't. I don't know, some of you all may, but they want to know, they don't want to know about, you know, what you pay in such and such this week. They want to know, and when I give my money, is it going to help somebody? Now, yeah, there, it takes staff to do that. And you have to tie that in to you know, what it is that you are trying to do in the community. Uh, but so when you're asking for resources, particularly during this season, how are you tying it back in your offering appeal to something that you as a church are doing in the community with people who need help? You will get more from your people, not just monetarily, but you'll get more of their time, of their creativity, of their ideas, of their service, when they know that what you're connecting, they're giving to is going to go help somebody. Uh, I just gave somebody a good nugget for the offering on Sunday, uh, that when you're getting ready to ask, I dare you to put out an initiative within your congregation that you want, and you may not be able to do what Hamilton Mill does and feel it feeds a thousand people uh, every week, right? That's huge. I wish we could do that. I wish we could feed a thousand people with a hot meal every week. Uh, that's not what we can do right now, right? Um, but what we can do is we can provide assistance and support, you know, uh, based on our context. So I want to I want to encourage you and challenge everybody. Can I challenge y'all? Am I all right? Can I challenge y'all from Georgia? Is that okay? Uh, <laughs> I want to challenge you. Find somebody to help, and ask your congregation to help you help them. And when you do that, it could be 10 people. It could be find 10 children, 10 families in your community, and you want to provide food for them for a week. I promise you, you can find 10 families who need some food. And say, look, as a congregation, we're going to commit to providing food for a week for these 10 families. And in order to do that, we need you to give because this is what it's going to take to do so. I can almost guarantee you that that steak dinner that some of your members wanted to have um, even though they can't go out and eat it, but they went to Publix and they bought that steak. I get, they may, you know, they may get some chicken instead of the steak and they may give you the, the rest of the money. Um, I'm being facetious, but the, the truth is people will make the sacrifice to give you the means to do the ministry. If you ask them for it and if you connect it to something that you're trying to do. Um, so going forward, yeah, we're right. Diana's right there are going to be a lot of people who are hurting um, in this crisis and coming out of it. And so uh, I think annual conferences have to be prepared for uh, crisis management and what it looks like to be a resource to people. Uh, no churches have to be prepared. Um, and how do we take the burden off of, Oh, we're going to get, we're going to get into talk about apportionments and I don't want to go that far, but, uh, <laughs> but you know, uh, we have bills that we've got to pay and how can our portion dollars go even more towards um, identifying things in communities that truly need help uh, and, and being creative about helping, helping those communities. I don't know if I even said that right, but, I think conferences are going to have to step in and do some major work too uh, in helping churches find ways to help people. Uh, I hope, uh, and I'm, I'm, I know I'm talking to some conference leadership on this call, uh, and I will say the same thing to my conference leadership. Uh, I hope that conference leadership across the country are spending time in conversation with local churches and with pastors and asking the question, um, how do you need us? How can we help? And uh, I think at this point, we're going to need more grassroots. Um, we're going to need more organic ways of doing ministry. Um, and it's going to have to be local. It's going to so be local. Let's pause there. I think I want to check in with uh, Reverend Lewis, Andy, to see if he has any questions or anything in specific uh, that you want us to um, ask now on while Dr. Muriel is on the call. <clears throat> Thank you, Estana. Thanks for inviting me. And uh, you may have noticed uh, Jarita Williams Louie and Andrew Pfizer, also who oh, are yeah. part of our Center for Missional Outreach team, have joined the call. Um, we're uh, excited to be a part of it. So, uh, Reverend Muriel, thank you for speaking to 
um, some of the ways that you're seeing uh, missional outreach emerge and, and shift and change in this pandemic uh, reality. You know, toward the end, I guess I have uh, one question. Um, toward the end, you were commenting that you feel like it's really critical for local churches to uh, identify, um, you know, someone to help. And, and if I heard you right, you know, to identify partners who can help them do that. Uh, you, there may, I think you alluded to it early in your comments that, you know, Cascade has been um, directing volunteers um, and, and people to, to work with community partners who are on the ground uh, doing the work. So I just, I wonder if, if um, just in your context there in Atlanta, if you've seen any uh, really uh, compelling models for how that's working, meaning uh, ministries that are on the ground doing the work that um, are meeting the emerging needs and the churches can partner with. That hearing about maybe an idea or two that's working there might help open our eyes to things that are happening here. Yeah, I would. Um, for us, it was uh, the Atlanta Community Food Bank. That is where we get, we have a, a food pantry that we open every week. Uh, food pantry, cold and closet, uh, every Thursday. And so it was because we had already had that relationship and they provide all of our food for us. Um, it was when they told us, hey, look, we're looking to, to give away 500 food boxes in this area to this community. Can you help us? We said, absolutely. We can't do five communities, but we can do this community and we can take ownership for this one. Uh, and so uh, they assemble all the boxes. They put everything together. They have their own plan for distancing and safety and food safety things that logistically we didn't have to worry about, thank God, because it would have been a logistical challenge for us to just get people <laughs> in that space, but that's what they do. Uh, and so we were able to provide, you know, volunteers and shifts to go and help to distribute uh, because they had already put it together. So I would say some best practices, look for organizations that have the manpower that pay people already on their staff to assemble things and they just need some additional help, right? They just need maybe the distribution uh, channel or, you know, they, they need the funding for it. And because still, I, I still believe that if we provide some funding, I mean, that's almost as good as us handing the food out. I mean, I would love to hand it out and make that personal connection, but if they don't have the funding, then it's not going anywhere. You're not gonna feed anybody. Uh, so, that's one model. Uh, I think another thing to consider is how can you do something if, if you just like uh, Reverend Patterson on your campus where it can continue to shine the light on you as a church in your community doing something on your campus that's safe for people. Safety, safety has to be first. Um, so if it's uh, as a as a conference, you know, we're going to have a goal of galvanizing <clears throat> 30 churches that are going to uh, that we're going to ask and we're going to request that you offer your campus as a site for a food distribution one Saturday a month. And uh, as the conference, you'll partner and we just ask that the church would provide enough volunteers to uh, distribute the food. That's something that's doable, um, but you also have to, you know, procure masks and gloves and things like that. So there are challenges, but again, it can be done. Those are just a couple of examples of things that I've seen work, uh, things that I've seen done. Uh, food insecurity is a big issue right now. It's a major issue right now. Food insecurity, um, also uh, rental assistance, major issue right now. Um, I think in, a, in addition to that, if you want to, if you want to talk um, on the domestic violence side of things, providing uh, resources for people who may be in situations um, and they need an outlet, they need someone to talk to. Um, so providing counseling services or um, some kind of resource. So I, I think we have to redefine what service is even in this season. 
service may be food or it may be mental health service or it may be you know some kind of other assistance um but i would just encourage you all to think outside the box and and use your resources that are uh, that are at your disposal i hope that helped yes yeah, so Thank you very much. I, one this point I want to lift up that I heard you say is that when you were describing that initial um, example of the way you partnered with the food bank, it sounded like you already had an existing and strong relationship with that community partner so that they had a vision and then they reached out to you to ask for your help, which just underscores uh, how important it is for all of us in all of our contexts to develop those kinds of relationships with ministry partners um, in our communities. Uh, so often it's through those relationships that, you know, the opportunity for service emerges and we can yeah. step into that. So thank you for sharing that example and reminding us of that. I've also seen, you know, people, and maybe you all have heard of this, um, you know, providing meals for essential workers. Uh, I think these things are important. Um, we did, I can't think of how many flood buckets we did. Um, and obviously the flood buckets from uh, through UMCOR. And inside of the flood buckets, you know, we often put these N95 masks. And so we were encouraging churches before they sent the buckets to the warehouse, go through them because there's, you know, a need for N95 masks right now for uh, emergency care workers. And, you know, I know there are some churches who went through and found hundreds of masks and were able to donate them and give them to uh, essential care workers. So it's things like that that are right underneath our nose. And I didn't even didn't even think about that. Um, but I got a call from Action Ministry, someone who did the outreach work. And they said, hey, Kevin, have y'all you know thought about this this project? So I just think there's a lot of things that we can do uh, to your point, uh, Andy, when we have the major point here is relationship relationship. And if you haven't built relationships with people in your community and organizations, you need to do so. Uh, because in times like these, you know, they need us and it provides a great opportunity for us. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Other questions of questions. Yes, Diana, are there perhaps um, other questions from anyone else on the call? I and mean, I'll turn it back to you. Um, yeah. Are there any other questions from uh, anyone else that's on the call uh, related to uh, ways that we can do ministry with the poor um, that we can, you know, maybe talk to uh, Kevin about or talk to other people that may be on the line that, that are already doing something that uh, you, can, oh, you can share? It. Dr. Patterson, will you uh, wait? Yeah. I'm, I'm doing multiple things in the house at the same time, so forgive yes. me for being out. Listen, um, Dr. Muriel and everybody else, here's the burning question that we have in Hamilton Park. We are feeding all these people. We are seeing parents come in with small children, uh, teenagers, a lot, a lot of men, are homeless, everything. Mm -hmm. In a perfect world, we could leverage all this goodwill that we're doing and then bring them to church but the reality is we have to do church differently. So how do we create, when this is over, a church response to them that connects them and keeps them with us somehow, but not being so arrogant to say, oh, you must come in our building. You know, mm -hmm. should we have a parking lot church? Or how do, we, how do we hold on to all these good people that we have met during this feeding time? I think you hold on to them just like you're doing now. Uh, you know, you, you feed them, you talk to them, uh, you, you build. So often we want, we want to convert our serve, those who we serve into those with whom we worship. And that may never happen. I've had mm -hmm. to come to the conclusion that there will be some people that we feed that will never come and worship with us. Mm -hmm. And I have to be okay with that. Now, on the other hand, there will be some people that we feed and we serve and we help who will want to come to worship with us. And we have been the very thing that keeps them away. Uh, we have, we have been the very people that keeps them away. We've been the detractor after we've helped them, after we've done something good 
and then they come to our church or they mm-hmm. say, you know what, I want to, because not everybody's homeless. That's uh, right. or not everybody's help. Let me say that. Some people are homeless. Not everybody's helpless. Right. Right. So I think we've got to get out of this mindset that just because we feed somebody, they feel helpless. Mm-hmm. That's, that's not necessarily the case. Okay. Um, and so can we treat that person with the same dignity and humanity that we do our biggest tither? Mm-hmm. Or yeah. our choir director or our social mm. pastor, our senior pastor. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We have a people problem. That's our issue. We don't have a desire problem. Mm-hmm. People desire to be in community. People desire mm-hmm. to be loved. People mm-hmm. desire uh, to be, I think people desire to be connected to the church. Our problem is people. We don't know as Christians often how to treat people. Ooh. Hey, hey, Dr. Muriel. Well. I, I think you, you just said something there. And, and I think you, you, you started early. They said Romans 12 and 2. Yeah. And I think far too often, I'm going to speak of our denomination, we're about numbers and dashboard, butts in the seat. It's a different day. And I think from a conference level, from a local church level, we have to understand that everybody who we feed is not called to be a member of St. Luke. Mm -hmm. And I think we understand our why. Our why is not to, it's to make disciples. When I was hungry, you didn't put me in a leadership position, you fed me. Mm. I think everybody on this call, we have to understand why we do what we do. Mm-hmm. And I think God is waking us up now mm-hmm. through this pandemic to understand the institution must be more relational. That's right. And, and what I realized, uh, Reverend Masters, when we <clears throat> go to home, do homeless ministries with our people, our members don't even know how to communicate with them. Mm-hmm. It's like they mm-hmm. don't bite. Mm-hmm. <laughs> There you go. Mm-hmm. No, seriously. So there I go. think now we have to understand as, as the body of Christ that everybody we feed may not be a member of Hamilton Park, mm-hmm. but they're part of the beloved community. Mm-hmm. And I think that the system, the institution must rethink how we engage people. Mm-hmm. It's not about numbers anymore. It's about impact and meeting the needs of people. Mm-hmm. And we want to get people in our pews, but I think we need to shift that. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. Yeah, and and also, uh, Dr. Boyd, when we think about that and we think about ministry um, with, as opposed to ministry for, when we are high society, sadiddy, if you will, we we gonna put some food out there, but you can't, don't touch me, you know. Right. Mm-hmm. This is not a time, I'm not talking about the time of pandemic. I'm talking about right. just regular, ordinary yeah. times. Mm-hmm. But when you're talking about ministry with, you you hold their hand and you you walk with them and you talk to them you find out what can we do together it's a it's a different world and so this the way we used to do it i think kevin made a point and he may want to say some more about that we have a relation relational problem and i want you to know god is not happy with that mm-hmm. there are people that I came to know and love, and I mean dearly love, uh, that were homeless when I was at Warren. I want you to know, they protected me like nobody else. When I would leave my house in Richardson and go to Warren because there's some papers that I needed to turn in a report to the conference or the district, whatever it was, it needed, I needed it that night. And Henry would say, you can't go into South Dallas. It is, it's going to be nine o'clock. And I say, no, I got my posse. And I, <laughs> and I drove off to that church. You know, they didn't, I didn't call them to tell them I was coming. I knew mm-hmm. they were, they were going to be on the street. They saw my car drive up mm-hmm. and they came right over. What you doing here? What, mm-hmm. what you doing here? And they were right there. I went in the church, got what I needed and was never scared. What we have to understand is they have so many gifts to give. Yes, yes. They are valuable. They are made in God's image. And if we right. can understand yeah. how to walk with them and and receive their gifts and honor their gifts. I mean, there was, there was a couple of them when we didn't have a musician uh, and they told me on Wednesday when we, that they knew how to play. 
somebody told them they knew how to play and we invited them to the sanctuary. They did not feel honored. They thought, You're, they're not going to really let me come in here. Yes, we are. And mm. so it was, it was a, a learning not new for me uh, because I serve the people in South Central LA. Right. I've come to understand that people are people and they're made in God's image. It doesn't matter what race you are. It doesn't matter if your hair is straight or curly. It doesn't matter how much money you have. We may not all have the gifts of Dr. Kevin Muriel or Dr. Bui, but we have gifts and we have to understand and, and use those gifts. So, um, Reverend Masters, Dr. Dr. Muriel. go ahead, go ahead, Miranda. Thank you, Reverend Patterson. Um, Dr. Muriel, can you talk a little bit about, um, so everyone's looking forward to after this because it, it's gonna be better, right? It's gonna be different. It's not gonna be this, we're ready for this to be over. But as a pastor, can you talk a little bit about, um, how we're going to have to be agile and what we can be engaging because um to reverend master's point and to one of your points earlier um us having messages that emphasize that right now makes us valuable right now as, as churches and as, as faith communities um but gets that lesson about we're all valuable because i am seeing i'm thinking that's what's going to happen talking to a lot you know my previous life as a as a as a researcher and demographer and sociologist, there's going to be some quick shifts. So we're going to be excited to get out, but then all of the people that have been able to fill out the paperwork to not have their mortgage or their um, their house foreclosed or their rent um, or be evicted, um, they're going to need legal help. Like they're this going to be rapidly changing things. We're going to be happy and then we're going to be down and then up and then down. And many of our folks who were happy to serve are now going to find themselves in a position where they're questioning their value because now that now they need to ask, they need to ask to be served, yeah. right? And so, how do we care for their spirits and their souls? so that they understand that they're, they, they transfer that lesson about who we've been doing ministry with being valuable to even though my life has changed and now I'm gonna take home the extras after I help serve, that I am still as valuable so that they don't back out of engagement with us. Our numbers don't go down, because, right? There's some things that happen to church life when our members change positions, right? That has to do with their soul and our agility to go from, here's a message of hope to value, to um, sit down somewhere, to chat, right? There's, there's some agility there that is not a, a six week sermon, right? Series, that is not a year long series. So can you talk a little bit about that agility? I think you just said it. I mean, I think you, you answered your question with saying you have to be agile. <laughs> You've got to be agile during the season, uh, you know, it's, and you have to be deeply intentional and deeply intentional caring for people um, and agile. I, I want to say that when we come out of this, everything, all the, for, for me, um, it is, I'm going to have to spend a lot of time with my people. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to spend a lot of time with your people. And you're going to have to be okay with that. There's no way around that, right? Um, and you're going to have to spend a lot of time with your people, reassuring them, but also sitting with them in the midst of the brokenness uh, that is inevitable. Think about it this way. People who have died have had to have funerals. Now you have to go back and have a memorial service. So now they've got to relive that entire experience of even if they've you know somewhat um, come to the come to the realization that it happened, but now I've got to sit in front of, of I've got to sit in the sanctuary with more people mourning, crying, remembering their life. And now I've got to relive that. So even and and people aren't thinking about they really aren't thinking about that, but because they just want to have a service. But that in and of itself can be traumatic to have to relive. I mean, two funerals for one person, like that's, that's a lot. Um, it's a lot on you and it's a lot on the, on the people. I think you have to spend time with folks. Um, but I want to go back to what we, what we were just talking about too, because I think all these things connect. Uh, some of y'all know what it's like 
And since we're all pastors and preachers, we can be honest. Some of y'all know what it's like not to want to go to your church. <laughs> <laughs> be around some of your people. I mean, <laughs> we all got them. And some of you know that there are some weeks that you just walk in, you're like, okay, I don't even know about this. Um, I had to hit on mute to say amen. Hey Amen. Uh, Jim, Jim was with me. There ain't nobody else with me. I got Jim with me. Uh, so what in the world do we think other people are going to feel if sometimes we don't even want to be there um, with the people of God and the saints? Uh, so, and so I'll be doggone if you're going to ask me to come and sit in your church and soak up all the looks and the judgment and all of this from folk Number one, I don't have no, but the second thing, you know, why would I do that? I would rather you feed me or help me and I go on about my business um, and I'll come back next week. But I think in order to, because Brandon brings up a good point, in order for us to reach the masses and care for the masses of people, we're going to have to care for people and we're going to have to just love people, no matter who they are, what they bring. Um, because if the truth be told and we don't, we are, I think we tell the truth uh, from the word, but we're not good at telling the whole truth. If the truth be told, we all are a mess in some way. And we all got some messiness that we are working through having to deal with. Um, I think that's what uh, made the humanity of Jesus so powerful that he wasn't just fully God, but he was also human. And the humanity says that I can cry, I can wrestle. The humanity says, you know, I know what it, I know what it means to suffer and have pain. Um, we're going to have to be human for a while. I just, that, that's what I really wanted to say. Brent, I, Brent, I went all around the mountain to say that we're going to have to be human with people for a while um, and let people know that, you know, we feel what they feel and we sit there intentionally with folks. So. Kate, you had a comment? You didn't have a comment? I thought I thought I saw Kate talking. Okay. Well, yeah, I um had a comment and a um a question, Dr. Muriel. Such a pleasure. Uh I met you briefly and um just a pleasure to meet my um my aunt and uncle were a part of Cascade when Reverend Lowry was there. So it's just a pleasure to see the work going on um with, with young people now. But I did want to um, ask and speak to um, doing ministry with that we were talking about earlier, Dr. Bowie brought up and, and how we are, or how, how you are entering to um, the, the vision of racial inequities that we're seeing with COVID-19 impacting um, black people, um, people of color, communities of color, and how it's killing um, us in a way that is um, demographically different from any other um, group. And so um, when I uh, had a conversation with our, my coworker and my director this morning, Andy Lewis and Andrew Pfizer, and Andy um, brought up an article that's talking about um, leading through blizzard or winter, are we entering into a, a mini ice age? And um, my, um, my reaction or my response to that um, that suggestion in that article is that we're, I'm hoping that we're moving into a, an ice age, a mini ice age, that will be different after this, but that we'll take the time to lament and take the time to grieve and, like you said, be human so that we can see people and so that we can honor and love and, and walk in dignity with people. But I'm hoping that we can um, dismantle I am, uh, we're working toward dismantling uh, racial inequities and injustices in healthcare with um, some of the things that we are working on with the journey toward racial healing. And so healing means that there's a lot of wounding and there's some things that we uh, actually need to name and we need to make sure that as a system, um, we are um, building structures that will take down supremacy of whiteness and that will actually um, name that and then we can move forward because some people aren't entering the church because we don't name and we don't say and we 
um, exclude because of skin color, because of class, of course. But it, for me, the way that I enter into life is from a perspective and a framework of, um, of racial injustice. And so um, we're still working through what that means for our country historically. And I'm asking and wondering, how are you seeing that played out in, um, in Atlanta, in Cascade, and the work that you're doing? And um, if you have any suggestions as to what your hope is or what your, um, your vision is as we walk through the healing um, for, um, for these um, communities, for, these, um, for those of us who are seeing the, um, the impact of COVID. For me, I always talk about um, Black people. We've been doing this, you know, um, the, this pandemic, it, it, it um, exacerbates for those of us who are in the Black community, the things that are already twisting our arms and, and killing us. And so I'm hoping that as a denomination and as a um, conference, we'll be able to um, build a different kind of, of um, beloved community once we, um, or as we're moving through, we don't have to wait. And once we um, kind of have some restrictions lifted as to how we're going to do that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I have a, I have a problem with uh, pursuing racial healing. If at the same time, we aren't pursuing the dismantling of the systems that cause the hurt in the first place. So while we're talking about racial healing and reconciliation, we also need to be talking about how do we dismantle institutional racism and racism that has been pervasive uh, in our land for centuries um, and is part of the fabric of our nation. Uh, I think we all need to heal. I think that, um, but, but I can heal, but I also need to be treated as a human too. <laughs> that's, uh, that's another thing. And, and the, the truth is, you know, these are uncomfortable conversations for a lot of people, right? Uh, I, I, but I love having these conversations uh, because if you don't live in the discomfort of talking about racism and institutional racism, uh, much of which, you know, uh, was around far earlier than you and I, all of us, um, these things have been happening for years. I just thank God that now we can talk about them. Um, but when you talk about the inequities uh, in healthcare and uh, and in in the food disparities and so much the environmental injustice so much black and brown people dying at a higher rate is a direct result of all of these systemic injustices and issues that we've seen for sister centuries it's not just because more black people getting sick it's because of the underlying issues that are a direct result of you know systemic racism. Um, we know the CDC just reported that 30% of COVID-19 patients are African American, even though we make up 13% of the population. Um, you got to start asking yourself why. Why uh, in Chicago, 70% of the COVID-19 deaths Black folks, um, Michigan, Georgia, all have um, reported higher percentages of Black and Brown people uh, contracting the the virus and dying from it. Um, and so I would simply say that the church has to be on the front lines of having these conversations. And so while we're talking about serving people and helping people, we need to be talking about what it means, uh, what, even within our denomination, uh, for, social, for injustice to be pervasive and uh, for us not to really have those hard conversations uh, about uh, racism and racial inequality that we see even in our own church. If the church can't get it right, then how can we expect society to get it right? So what does that take, right? Uh, for me, it takes those who are in the majority, who you know, are who have built the power structure, and who have the power within the structure, to say, you know what, this ain't right. And that takes a relinquishing of power. And people don't like to relinquish power, right? <laughs> we don't. People don't like to. Really, uh, this world, this nation is built on power, uh, but it takes those who are in the majority group to say, look, this is not right. And there are some inequities that only we can work to solve. So you start doing that, right? You do it through a multiplicity of ways, um, particularly during this season when we're talking about church life. Um, do you all have a church development uh, office there? A church development office. 
Um, one of the things that we're looking at is, is okay, well, we've been paying apportionments all these years. And for us, we haven't benefited from many church development funds that the majority of church development funds coming through our conference go into predominantly white churches. I get it. Hey, the majority of, you know, our denominations over 90% white. I get it. I understand. However, we're asked to pay apportionments just like everybody else. Most of the time we pay 100%. So how does that, how do those funds then flow back out of the structure of the institution into places where we can see equitably those funds are being dispersed? And by the way, who makes the decisions for the dispersing of the funds? You've got to go back and just start asking questions. This may be a lot further than you wanted me to go, uh, but uh, I'm just kind of tracing some things. Um, all of this matters when we start talking about even a conference's response to COVID-19, reopening, et cetera. So what churches are you going to get give, most, give the most attention to? What pastors are you going to give the most assistance to? Uh, if you don't think that that's going that this is going to play a part in that decision making, we're all fooling ourselves, because it's been a part of the conversation for for since the founding of this denomination and our church. Um, and so, I just want to be clear that those who sit at the table have to always operate with the mindset of. Are we doing what's best for the whole and not just a segment? And sometimes when you ask those questions, well, not sometimes, all the time when you have to ask those questions, you have to lean a little bit more towards saying, how is this going to affect those who have historically been marginalized as a part of the structure? That's called thinking equitably. We're not going to be equal. Y'all can, we can continue to talk about this whole equality thing. I, equality, I think, is in the great by and by. I want us to be, Diana, I promise, one of these days we're going to be equal in the eyes of Jesus and in the great by and by. We're going to all be there. But while we're on earth, generationally, we know that we don't start at the same place, right? We just don't. Uh, and we've got to acknowledge that reality. And so once we acknowledge that we are not equal, then we can say, okay, if we're not equal, how can everybody be equitable? How can we build the platform that was not in place for us? How can we build it so that for generations that to come, that are to come, for new clergy that come into the conference, for new churches that are developed and built, how can we make it equitable for everybody? We need to have an equity conversation. Um, and conferences have to be honest about the inequities that exist because our denomination and other institutions are simply microcosms of the larger macro that we see in society every day. And, you know, that's, that's our reality. I know that was probably a lot further, uh, that you want farther than you wanted me to go. Uh, but I just think it's an important conversation we have to have. So don't talk to me about racial healing. If we aren't going to talk about destroying the systems that brought the hurt in the first place. Uh, and don't be the person that continues to say, well, I love everybody and I preach Jesus when, in, in essence, you're the one progressing the empire. So, Dr. Muriel, to that point, um, can you talk a little bit to make some things plain about, so the other thing that we have in this moment in front of us is the ability to create disruption to what I call the charity industrial complex, which is what we contribute to, which is the unequal, we're all helping because we all love everyone, but it's the unequal distribution of those resources in a way that don't get to the people who are the most vulnerable um, and don't get to the communities, right? Um, that the system is also simultaneously um, impacting in the most negative ways. And so right now I feel like we are present in a moment where not only have we, not only are we sitting in a moment where we're creating invited disruptions and innovations, but we have the ability to expose 
and change that entire complex, right? Whether it's to completely dismantle it or make it more equitable. And so what are some ways we can talk about the things that we're doing and trying so that they don't get dismissed as, well, we just did that during COVID times. No, our ministries were able to get to the most vulnerable, to the majority and brown to the folks who were on the front lines as essential workers which happened to be because of the industries mostly black brown women right we were able to do that and it wasn't just a special case we should do that moving forward so how do we talk about what we're doing as not just uh what we did in the meantime but as legitimate things to fund as disruptions yeah and then name those disruptions yeah, I mean, so you have a, a few different things working, right? You've got your your larger structure. Um, you know, you've got your conference, and then you've got your local church, your conference, your district, your local church. I think on every level, there needs to be a consistent conversation. And the things, the same things need to be raised on each level. So if you're talking from a conference perspective, number one, I'm the first thing I'm all, I always ask conference leaders when they talk about racial justice and serving the, all, you know, all this. I always ask, who is at your table? Who's at the table? Who's talking? Uh, because if you don't have anybody who ever raises the issue at the table, then you won't know about it. And it's not that there's any ill will going on at the table. It's just, you know, there's no, there's no conscience there for, you know, the thing that would matter to, to me or to you. Um, so what comes out is the things that matter to the people at the table. That's exactly what happens in, in all these cases on the district level, as well as, you know, the local church level. Uh, so I think you have to have people at the table who can have those conversations. Um, but here's what I, here's what I really think. Uh, here's my, my, you know, if I, if I had a vision for the church, man, it would be people of every race, of every socioeconomic background and demographic coming together to say, you know what, we're going to look intentionally at every community, at every single community from, you know, your, your low income minority community to your upper echelon minorities to your low income white communities, your upper echelon white communities and everything in between. We're going to look at diversity and we are going to be intentional. Every time we look at doing something, we're going to have every group represented at that table to talk about how we're going to do this. I think if you do that, not saying you're going to solve every, every problem, but you'll be a little closer uh, to working some things out. But if you don't have the people at the table, you're never going to get there. I don't care how you try to flip it. You can throw money at it. You can do what, but you're never going to get there if you don't have the right people at the table. Um, that's why I thank God for people like S. Diana Masters and others who are at the table uh, in you all's conference who can raise some of those issues and who have, you know, who have equity uh, in the conference. Uh, but, I, but I think it has to be a broader conversation. Uh, and the last thing I'll say, and I'll be quiet after this, is... Uh, we can't think that everyone is working against us. There are some people who consciously, who, who unconsciously uh, don't know what to do. And who seriously just want to, want to learn. And we have to give people space uh, to be human and people space to be vulnerable. Uh, and we have to give people space, quite frankly, to be ignorant. Yeah. And I had to learn that. Uh, because I can come to a conversation. I'm like, well, how do you, what do you mean you didn't know about 400 years of, uh, you know, of <laughs> injustice toward black women? What do you mean you didn't know about the inequities and, you know, the injustices? What do you mean you didn't know we're not equal? And some people just have never connected the dots. And so my job as a prophet is to help people, a pastor is in the midst of it, to help people to try to connect the dots. Uh, and to be patient with people, but also to push people because this is not comfortable work. And don't think that you're going to come to this table and have a kumbaya moment with me and just leave and we're going to be, you know, this, don't do anything. No, I'm going, to be in, I'm, I'm going to be the agitator that you never thought would be in your life. I'm going to agitate you. And every time we bring I'm going to say, well, what are you doing? What are you doing? And you need an agitator at the table. Now, I don't know if bishops or whoever will put, a, put an agitator, but you need somebody at the table who's going to press the button. When the button needs to be pressed, you need somebody who's going to press it to say, are we thinking about this? Why aren't we doing this? Well, it's not, you know, it's not comfortable. It's, it's hard. We can't do it. Who says we can't do it? 
-hmm. You know, I can do all things. That's what I thought the word says. But anyway, I'm done. I'm, I'm sorry, Diane. No, no, don't be sorry. We're we're glad. Dorita opened up this door, so we she did. She opened it up, and I, you know, opening up the we door. We weren't supposed to go there. She, <laughs> So it wasn't on the agenda, but I think it was still important because it is in uh, the section with uh, doing ministry with. I just want to add one thing or even maybe question you on one thing, um, Kevin, just to take it just one step forward before we start to kind of wrap up for the day. Um, you were talking about having people at the table, you know, and what's implied is having people of color at the table. The thing that, that I have found in my years of, of being um, just alive and in all the leadership roles I've had is that it's, it's important to have a person at the table, but this idea of having somebody at the table because they are black does not Ooh. cut the mustard. Uh -uh. Doesn't, just because you're black, don't mean that you like me as a black woman. Don't mean that you speak right. a Miranda as a multi-race woman. Don't even know that you know Miranda is multi-race. What does that look like? Right. You know, right. you have to have people that really understand, know the issues, well read, well uh, connected, and can really speak uh, for the issues. So, um, so it's it's important to have people at the table. I agree but not just anybody. You I know, totally sometimes agree. we have conferences and districts that put people on committees um, just because they're black and yeah. they want to speak to black, talk about the black issue. That's, that, that has not worked and it will never work. So would you just speak a little bit about that and yes. I'm gonna wrap our day up. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you for saying that. And, and let me clarify, Lord, you need to be down with the calls I don't care what color you are, as long as you are down with the calls right. and you can speak. Absolutely. Uh, I have been in meetings before where, uh, a, and this guy who's, who's actually very close to me, a uh, white male has been more woke than, you know, some of my black colleagues. <laughs> I'm just like, listen to him, right? You know, he, he, he gets it. This is, this is really about what is, what's best for humanity and whoever can speak that truth. Uh, and sometimes that truth has more power coming from someone in the majority group. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, because you can, you can speak from, from one who has historically been the position in the position of the oppressor. When the oppressor can speak for the oppressed, that's powerful. Mm -hmm. Not saying that you yourself have been the oppressor, but out of the group. Um, but no, yes, thank you for saying that. Uh, you need to be down with the calls and, mm -hmm. and, and be able to speak and intellectually and intelligently about right. that's the cause. equally important equally yeah. important yeah not not bad grammar not mm -mm. not ghetto not you know all of this other speak to the people of power the same language that they speak that's that's one thing but the other thing is that we can't forget in this is when we think about that not only does the person have to have the right color they have to be knowledgeable about the issues that yeah. are at hand because sometimes you might have somebody at the table that is so worried about their job. I'm, I'm talking about the church now. So worried about their job that they may have the all of the pieces, but they don't have the courage to speak up because they don't want to be reappointed. They don't want to be appointed to something that where they may not be able to make a living. So there are a lot of moving parts in this and um, so all of that is you have to be really careful as to who you bring to the table. Yeah. And conferences have to provide space and leaders. And this is why I say denominations and particularly in our, in our, in our denomination, uh, and I would even impress this upon, upon the leadership of the North Texas Conference, have, have leadership in place that will allow space for disruption because it makes you better. We all need to be disrupted. All of us. It makes us better. Um, have, have, space for people to say, hold on, let's think about this without fear of being reprimanded. Mm -hmm. uh, it, was, it was told to me by a very wise pastor uh, who uh, has been a, a hallmark in this, um, in this denomination for a long time, Bishop Woody White. Mm -hmm. Bishop White, who is a mentor of mine, would always say about leadership, 
don't want to surround yourself with too many people that will tell you yes. Right, right. Don't surround yourself with a bunch of yes folk. Mm -hmm. Surround yourself with people who respect your leadership, but will push you to think more broadly. Um, that's just a le leadership lesson. So uh, I would say that in these days of COVID-19, my encouragement to this amazing conference, because y'all really are a great conference. When I travel across the, the, the United States and, and see other conferences, I mean, you guys are in fairly in, in pretty good shape compared to a lot of folks, even in this time of, of COVID-19. We all have our issues, right? Um, North Georgia included. Uh, Y'all are in good shape. And you guys have good forward-thinking leadership. Um, Dr. Master, uh, Diana, and, you know, her husband Henry, and, you know, so many others who I've come to know and to respect um, in, in the North Texas Conference. And so you all continue to stay the course. I'll be praying for you uh, during this season. Uh, but lead courageously. You know, if I, if I could challenge your leadership, lead courageously, but lead equitably. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of different faces in this conference that need help and that need assistance. And pay attention to them all. Thank you. Thank you. Brothers and sisters, it's been a long day. We had a short lunch, just a short break. We never did really take a bathroom break. We've worked really hard today. And uh, I'm going to ask you to give help me in giving um, Dr. Muriel a thumbs up for the information he's given us today. And I, I thank him for that. Um, I called him on a short notice to say we're completely changing the agenda. Uh, we're not just having the black folks, we're going to have the, black, the white folks come too. About <laughs> this. <laughs> and he said, whatever you need, my friend, whatever you need. And so I thank him for being willing to be flexible in what he um, had already planned. We planned this date in August of 2019. Uh, had no idea that this virus was coming around, but you know, you, you have to be prepared in season and out of season. So thank you, Dr. Muriel, for your flexibility. Thank you for all that you've given us today. Thank you for your challenges. Um, Matt, uh, you're, you're on the line and you n didn't have any idea I was gonna call on you, but uh, that's okay, because we're on the team. So I'm gonna ask you if you will uh, announce again what's happening on Thursday, and then um, you know see if anybody has any question, be sure and tell them where they can get the link. And pray, pray, pray. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, so Thursday, we're, we're just looking at um, how can we be proactive as we begin to consider, uh, you know, we've, um, we responded to sort of having to pivot and the changes that we've had to make. And now how can we uh, sort of get in front of it and begin to think uh, as visionary leaders about what God's doing, that none of this has taken God um, off guard and that God is still actively moving in our world and how can we partner uh, with that and um, be uh, proactive or pro responding to the uh, to the events in our world and in sort of the changing uh, context of ministry that we live in. So I think Owen actually in the uh, chat room there shared um, some of the details. That's Thursday mm -hmm. at 1:30 for the yeah. CCD webinar, and uh, yeah, would love to to see you all on that. Okay, thank you. We're going to post this. Um, the recording of our Zoom call on our uh, conference page. So if you miss something that you were taking notes on, it'll be there. Um, so be sure if you need to reach me, just feel free to call me. Uh, you have my cell number 213-880-7009. Our conference um, emails are the same. Uh, Dr. Muriel and Jarita, let me just speak to both of you just for a second. Both of you have exciting things happening and you don't know it's the same thing. Both of you are getting ready to have baby boys around the same time. So I know uh, Kevin is excited about his son. Right. And I know Jarita is excited about her son. So I wanted both y'all to know that. And on that note, I know both of you have been praying and Kevin's been speaking all day. So Jarita, I'm going to ask you to just close us in prayer because you know we've been praying for you and I know you have been praying. So on that note, we're going to ask you to close us in prayer. Well, congratulations, Dr. Muriel. <laughs> Thank well, you. You so, too. You too. Yeah, I, I tell people not to call my baby no Corona baby. <laughs> 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 well, 
let's go to um to our god our creator in prayer god look at us gathering um through technology that we probably didn't um um, think about before um, a pandemic or a crisis that took us by surprise, but never um, took you by surprise. God, we say thank you. We bow in your presence. We um, just lift you up in blessing and honor um, because you are God and God alone and you're still on the throne. So we say thank you for uh, going before us, making every crooked place straight and every rough place plain. We bless you for helping us to be innovative and creative in the things that you called us to do. We bless you, God, for allowing us to do the work that you've already called us to. So, Lord, I pray um, blessings over uh, Dr. Muriel, his um, wife, and um, uh, his children the one to come and the one that's already here, I think. <laughs> and I pray, God, that you would um, just continue to bless Cascade as they um, uh, do the work that you've called them to. And Lord, we thank you for the North Texas Conference, for um, the Methodist Church and for the church um, globally. We pray, God, that you would um, just be with us and for us and help us to see and to um, be a word that causes um, this world to see um, your son high and lifted up. So Lord, we bless you and we thank you for um, today and the days to come. And we ask that you give us energy that we don't have. We ask that you help us to grieve and lament and rest and do what it takes to continue in this work, to reach out when we need it and to uh, settle down when we need that as well. So Lord, bless um, um, all of the all of the things that you've called us to do and calls us to walk up rightly in your word and truth. It's in the name of the Trinity that I pray these things. Amen. 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 Thank Amen. you, my brothers and sisters, for your tenacity to hang in there for all day for this long call. It's been um, exciting, but I know it's been really hard for us. Just, we, we're just zoomed out, but today was a good day. So thank you, Dr. Muriel and we will probably talk next week as we get ready for September. Absolutely. God bless, bless you all. God bless you all. Thank you. Blessings to everybody. Yes. Thanks.